be heard this afternoon, so we'll, we'll, we'll start off. Um, First panel: um, Sheila Dillon, Danielle Johnson, and uh, Head er Ehrlich, um, and then we'll do our preliminary. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Liz Braden, District 9 City Councillor, and I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Housing and Community Development. Today is March 21st, 2024. This hearing is being recorded. It is also live streamed at boston.gov backslash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82 and Fios Channel 964. Written comments may be sent to the committee email at ccchousing at boston.gov and will be made a part of the record and available to all councillors. Public testimony will be taken at the end of this hearing. Individuals will be called on in the order in which they signed up and will have two minutes to testify. If you're interested in testifying in person, please add your name to the sign-up sheet near the entrance of the chamber. If you're looking to testify virtually, please email our central staff liaison, Shane Pack, at shane, S-H-A-N-E, dot pack, PAC at boston.gov for the link and you will be added to the list. Today's hearing is on docket number 0265, order for a hearing to explore uh, a right to counsel pilot program for tenants facing eviction in the city of Boston. This matter was sponsored by councillors Ben Weber, Rusi Louisien and myself and was referred to the committee on January 31st. Today, I am joined by my colleagues in order of arrival, the lead sponsors, Councillor Weber, Councillor uh, President louis Jean, Councillor Flynn, and Councillor Murphy. Uh, I've also got a letter of absence from uh, our colleague, Councillor Mejia, which I'll read into the record. Dear Madam Chair and members of the Committee on Housing and Community Development, I'm writing to inform you of my absence during today's City Council hearing on docket uh, 0265, a hearing to explore the right to counsel pilot program for tenants facing eviction in the city of Boston. Due to a scheduling conflict, I am unable to attend. However, I, will, I would like to express my full support for establishing a tenant right to counsel pilot program for tenants facing the threat of eviction here in the city of Boston. I appreciate your understanding and that of the rest of the city council. Sincerely, Julia Mejia. So before we turn to our invited panelists, I'd like to offer our lead sponsors an opportunity uh, to make some opening statements. Councillor Weber, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here today for this important discussion on establishing a program in the City of Boston that can help address a huge disparity in, who's, in whose rights are enforced in housing court. I chose this topic for my maiden speech in January because the need for action was obvious. We know that tenants without an attorney rarely even make it to trial, but instead are more likely to lose their cases through default or agree to a settlement that simply requires them to vacate their housing immediately. The numbers are stark nationwide and here in Boston. You can expect to see 90% of landlords who have attorneys in housing court here, while less than 5% of tenants are represented by counsel. 90 to 5. If this were football, we would criticize the winners for running up the score. But that is the reality in Boston Housing Court, where the game is rigged in favor of landlords who have resources to hire attorneys against tenants who do not. The rising cost of housing has been well documented, and evictions come as a result. Indeed, evictions have surged to above pre-pandemic levels in Boston. And evictions for non-payment 
are more likely for single moms, people of color, and low-wage immigrant workers. A recent Globe article showcased how difficult evictions can be for people who face language barriers without an attorney. Mary Barrera, a Colombian immigrant evicted from her home in East Boston said, I quote, it's terrible to be there without an attorney. I was asked so many questions and I didn't know the answers because I didn't know how the law works. I didn't even know I was allowed to ask questions. Our state has some of the most stringent protections for renters, yet too many aren't aware they are available and fail to take advantage of the support available. An eviction filing triggers a cascade of effects on the individuals and on the community. Evictions contribute to homelessness, unemployment, and substance abuse. It triggers health problems in families being evicted, and an evicted tenant may face huge difficulties in finding replacement housing as landlords are reluctant to rent to someone with an eviction filing on their record. Uh, now, um, with this, now, with the city and state emergency shelter, uh, shelter system overburdened, a person or family that loses their housing is more likely than ever to wind up on the street. And even if they do get shelter and access to food, medical, and mental health services, this is a drain on scarce public resources that could have been avoided if only their rights had been effectively enforced. Studies have shown that for every dollar spent funding programs that provide tenants in need with attorneys and rental assistance, saves approximately three to six dollars in costs associated with the services they require when evicted. I was recently at housing court here in Boston and witnessed firsthand how jarring the eviction process was. In one case, a tenant without an attorney who required a Chinese interpreter was told by the judge to familiarize himself with Supreme Judicial Court decisions. In another case, a woman who had appeared, appeared in court on several occasions was told she would lose her case by default because she failed to appear at a hearing she said she did not receive the notice for. As an attorney myself, I know that if I missed a hearing, which happened once in 18 years, that telling the court that I did not receive the notice would result in the court setting up another hearing. Navigating a complex system such as housing court without an attorney should not be the norm in this commonwealth or in this city, especially where someone's housing is on the line. Moreover, I, and we'll address this later, the lack of attorneys often results in tenants not even getting a chance to assert their rights in court. As you'll hear from Professor uh, uh, Nicole Summers, evictions rarely result in a ruling from the housing court judge. Instead, nearly every eviction results from one of three things. A default, meaning the tenant failed to show up for a hearing in, or, fi or to file a required paper. Uh, an agreement to simply move out or a violation of agreement to do everything the landlord wants. These mediation agreements are hashed out by the tenants and landlord's attorneys directly with only a court staffer to watch. The power and balance in these mediations and the results, which mostly result in evictions, shows that the system is broken. The state legislature is currently considering bills from the House and Senate that would create a right to counsel statewide. Governor Healy, meanwhile, has allocated $3.5 million that will support exploring a right to counsel across the state. We should support these efforts, and I support passing a resolution soon that will uh, you know, show the state that we want action taken now. The situation now in Boston, however, requires us to address the problem here. As you will hear, this could include providing more attorneys, providing rental assistance, providing uh, support to organizing efforts de dedicated to letting tenants know their rights. As of today, 17 municipalities across the country have started access to council programs, a few of which you will hear from today. We should join them in supporting our residents in their hour of need. I want to thank my co-sponsors, the public, and our panelists for being here today so we can further discuss the need for a program and the potential structure it could take in order to complement efforts currently under review by our state partners. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Weber, lead sponsor. Councillor Louis Jean. And I, I would encourage everybody to try and keep the remarks uh, brief as uh, we have a lot of folks to hear from this afternoon. 
Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I want to thank uh, my co-sponsor, the lead sponsor here, Council Weber, for having the foresight to really make this not only your maiden speech, but something that we are dealing with um, and that we address as a city. We know that um, evictions lead to displacement, and uh, displacement leads to instability for our families, for our children in Boston Public Schools. We know that uh, our, when, when you hold all things equal, um, everything else constant, we know that women of color with children are being evicted disproportionately when compared to other groups. Housing court, I, I've said this repeatedly, um, is a place that damns people who are poor. And so all of our efforts need to be to counteract that. Um, I feel extremely privileged to be here in my second term as a city councilor and now city council president, but who really got my start caring about housing with people like Eloise Lawrence, who is going to be on the next panel as a student attorney at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, under the wisdom of late, the late David Grossman in, in figuring out how I could use my law degree fighting for those um, who just needed a place to call home. We often on the city council say that housing is a human right. And if we believe that, it has to be about making sure that people who don't have power, who don't have money, um, have people championing and fighting for their right to stay in their home and really preventing the displacement that leads to the gentrification, that leads to um, fracture in homes uh, and a lot of brokenness in, in our young kids. And so I'm excited to be here to talk with all of you, with Chief Dillon, Daniel Johnson, GBLS, everyone here, the tenants who have experienced um, eviction or who are facing eviction um, and, and did or did not have counsel, to be here with my former 303 attorney, Nicole Summers, who is... I've never called you Professor Summers, but I guess I will for this panel, Professor Summers, um, as we think about how we join efforts with the state effort to really make right to counsel a reality at the state level, and to think about how we use our budget here at the city level to make sure that we are doing everything we can to prevent displacement, to support attorneys and organizations that are working on this um, with our city dollars. So really happy to be here. Thanks again to my colleague, Council Weber, for having the foresight to introduce this as a topic, and I'm looking forward to the discussion and to see what we can do. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll invite your colleagues, uh, Councillor Murphy and Councillor Flynn, for brief, brief remarks. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you to the panel for being here. Thank you to the panel for the important work that you're doing across the city. I just wanted to touch on the opening statement of Councillor Weber. You mentioned the importance of language and communication access as well as part of this discussion. I was working with um, Sheila Dillon, and I want to say thank you to Sheila. Sheila, I was working with you and your team on Sunday evening in Chinatown with a family, couple families that were um, displaced because of a fire, and your team was very helpful. One of the critical parts of working together is ensuring all residents have equal access to um, and and, in, and are able to speak a language, and this language was Cantonese and Mandarin, but we were able to do that. My staff speaks that language fluently, but not having an interpreter available would have been a terrible injustice um, to these immigrant families. So I wanted to acknowledge the important work that Sheila, D Sheila Dillon's team is doing, helping people, but I also wanted to highlight the comment that Councillor Weber discussed, language and communication access must be a part of this discussion as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Flynn. Uh, Councillor Murphy? Thank you, and happy to be here for your hearing order on your maiden speech, Councillor Weber. Um, important issue, I am a renter. Uh, I know how important it is to keep up with rent in the city personally, but also just just knowing what's happening in our city and working closely also with um, Sheila in your office. Thank you for all you do to try to help keep people housed, get people housed. Um, and, you know, one of those family stories, and any time I drive down Dot Ave and I'm passing Sudan Street, I think of back in the 50s when my dad said he came home from school and all their belongings were on the street because they were evicted and my grandfather was a custodian, and my grandmother cleaned houses, and they had five kids, but Auntie Flo took them in. There were already three people in a two-bedroom apartment on Houghton Street, but took all seven of them in, and that's where they you know, raised their family, and they just made it work. And when I think about 
you know, now when people are asking how many bedrooms and how many bathrooms, when you think of many adults and growing children just making it work and it's expensive it's important also when court can be a scary place any place is scary when you feel as though you're not welcome or that you're not on the same footing i see that when people go into hospitals i saw it as a teacher as a special ed coordinator when families came in trying to advocate for their own children's rights and needs for services in the school system when they felt as though they couldn't ask questions or they didn't think um, you know their voice mattered one of the reasons I ran for office is to make sure people know whatever space in this city that you are welcome and I'll help advocate so happy to be here for this conversation to see how can we make sure that tenants are not treated differently and if they need help what can we do as a city to support them so that they can stay in a respectable place and they can not be ashamed for just trying to work hard and make ends meet because what we are seeing now is someone you never like we talk about like the food pantries and all people came during the pandemic and now everyone's saying families that used to be the volunteers are the ones getting in the lines now so we're going into a place where we're going to see more people who need this support so thank you for this hearing and looking forward to the conversation and how we can advocate thank you Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Um, I also have a letter of absence uh, from uh, Councillor um, Coletta. Dear Chair uh, Braden and Co City Council colleagues, I regret to inform you that I will be absent from today's committee hearing on docket 1265, order for a hearing to explore the right to counsel program for tenants facing eviction in the City of Boston. Uh, eviction has disproportionately impacted our valued immigrant neighbours in East Boston. I've heard directly from them that it is extremely difficult navigating a complex judicial system without an attorney. It is essential that we explore all options to level the playing field and mandate representation for tenants as a means to support housing stability and prevent homelessness. Sincerely, Gabriella Coletta. Um, I will just echo all the comments of my colleagues. This is a critical issue. Um, lack of representation or adequate representation in housing court uh, really uh, makes a very uneven playing field for so many of our uh, re residents in the city of Boston who face eviction. Uh, and so I really look forward to um, to this, this afternoon's discussion. I, in the interest of time, I will move along to the first... Oh, beg your pardon. Uh, Councillor Worrell, you've ju just been joined by Councillor Worrell. Thank uh, you. Would you thank like you. to make some brief uh, yeah, I'll keep it comments, brief. please? Yes. I just wanted to just say thank you to the panel. Um, Deputy uh, Director Johnson, um, for all your work. Um, I, know, I know I'm constantly sending emails um, to you, and you're, you're always being a resource uh, to the community um, and to the people um, that are going through um, housing instability at the time. And just speaks to uh, what all my counselors say, like the, the individuals that are reaching out to me. Um, regarding instability in housing is they're, they're typically, you know, um, single moms, um, you know, people from Dorchester, Mattapan, low to moderate income uh, communities, uh, Boston, lifelong Boston residents. So we need to do more. We need to keep on um, leveling the playing field inside of housing court. But I just wanted to say thank you for all your work. Thank you, Councillor Worrell. So let's move on to the first panel. Uh, uh, we first uh, is uh, Chief uh, Sheila Dillon, Chief of the Mayor's Office of Housing, Danielle Johnson, Deputy Director of the Office of Housing Stability, and Head Ehrlich, uh, Interim Managing Attorney at the Housing Unit of the Greater, Greater Boston Legal Services. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. Uh, so uh, I think, Sheila, uh, would you like to lead sure. off? <laughs> I, would, I would be happy to. Good afternoon, Chair Braden. Uh, Council President Louis Jean, uh, lead sponsor Councilor Weber, and other city councilors that are here today. For the record, my name is Sheila Dillon. I'm Chief of Housing for the City and the Director of the Mayor's Office of Housing. And I am here today with the one and only Danielle Johnson, Director of OHS. Um, first and foremost, I'd like you to, I'd really like to thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, the City Council is correct that access. Some people call it access to council. I, I sort of grew up calling it right to council is one of our most important housing issues uh, right now in Boston. And 
it is a tool that our, that our residents need now. Um, as you are aware, the city of Boston drafted and it was filed with the help of our members of the state legislature uh, a right to counsel bill in 2019. It was a good bill, it did not pass. Now the city is very, very supportive of the access to counsel bill, now at the State House, House Bill 4360. It's a reasonable piece of legislation. It is supported not only by the city, but 240 organizations across Massachusetts. And I, I do want to just take a quick second to thank Annette Duke and the Mass Law Reform. They have built a coalition that is just one of the most magnificent coalitions statewide that I've ever, ever seen and witnessed. And I look at this coalition and they're smart and they're dedicated and they're reasonable and they're rolling up their sleeves every single week working on this. And I say, if it can't get passed with this coalition, I worry about the, I worry about the state. Um, but H4360 would provide legal representation for low income tenants and eviction proceedings as has been mentioned. And as Councilor Weber mentioned, it would start to right the inequalities that we see in housing court right now where 90% of landlords are, are represented and only three to 5% of our tenants are. When We've always needed this in Boston. We've always needed this in Massachusetts. But as we come out of the pandemic, we need it so much more than we ever have. During the pandemic, there were moratoriums on evictions, and there was a steady flow of very, very uh, substantial federal resources to cities and municipalities so that we could provide rental relief. The moratoriums are no longer with us, they're no longer in place, and the federal money that we had in abundance, really what we needed to keep people housed during the pandemic, have pretty much all gone. So what is this translated into? An uptick in evictions, as been mentioned. Um, I was working with staff, and um, uh, Kyle Ribadu is here, and he uh, brought together and, uh, some folks to talk about the uptick in evictions last week. And let me impart some of the numbers that he shared with the group. In 2020, the, you know, when the pandemic was, was raging, there were 129 evictions. Execution, these are executions I'm talking about. Uh, that were granted by the court. In 2021, there were 252. And last year, there was 954. We are really back to where we were pre-pandemic level. And my fear is, with rising rents, that we'll see that number uh, increase. The majority of these cases were for non-payment. And the average rent owed was $4,500. Not a large amount of money to keep a family in their homes. So. Um, we recognize that tenants need to pay their rent, um, but if the tenant, we're, and we're not saying the tenants shouldn't pay their rent, but everyone runs into difficulty. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's non-payment, sometimes it's recertification, sometimes it's just not getting the right paperwork in and, and tenants find themselves in court. Research has shown that if tenants have legal representation, the outcomes are better certainly for the family, but they're also better for the landlord. Evictions are time consuming, they're expensive, and they really create neighborhood instability. So while we don't have it yet, I do want to uh, really thank, uh, like some of you have, the Office of Housing Stability, and especially Danielle Johnson and her team for all that they're doing every single day to keep people housed. They've cobbled together many, many tools, but um, it's never, it's not enough. And we really do need the state to pass a right, a right to a access to counsel uh, once and for all. But I just wanted to give an overview, and now I want to hand it over to Director Johnson, if I may, so she can sort of outline what we're doing at this city level. Thank, thank you, Chair Braden, and thank you, uh, Madam Councilor, President Luisian, and Councilor Weber uh, for bringing this uh, important issue to head. Um, as mentioned, we support, as, as Chief Dillon mentioned, we definitely support this effort and we support uh, the governor's uh, push for access to counsel throughout Massachusetts. The Office of Housing Stability is one of the first touch points for constituents within the city of Boston. Uh, questions for our office or resources uh, for our office range from financial assistance, as you can imagine, as Chief Dillon pointed out, to legal assistance, and that's where we see a large gap uh, in our ability to provide these resources to constituents. Our office receives upwards of 400 calls per month 
uh, and trying to put together resources to help constituents, as you can imagine, can be very difficult. Uh, and one thing that I do want to touch on that um, I think we'll hear a lot of throughout this hearing is the intricacies related to, non, or to eviction cases as a whole. Uh, and apologies for my uh, former, my current panelists, my former colleagues, uh, but this information may be uh, second, secondary knowledge at this point. Uh, but just to understand and for the record, uh, in Massachusetts there are three types of evictions, non-payment, fault, and no fault. Uh, each of these types of cases carry with it a different type of legal process. Uh, whether you can file a counterclaim, whether you can raise certain defenses, whether there are fair housing implications when you do file a certain type of or respond to a certain type of uh, eviction case. And I'm glad to see uh, Nicole Summers here who will talk, I'm sure, <laughs> about her work uh, related to affirmative, excuse me, related to uh, agreements for judgment and where that can really uh, be a detriment to tenants who don't have access to uh, an attorney. Uh, but these types of cases, as, as I mentioned, very multifaceted, very intricate, and without an attorney, and to your point, Councilor Weber, in your speech, uh, if you don't have an attorney having to explain what a motion to issue execution is to a lay person is very difficult, and also how do you even tell a person what information needs to go in those types of documents can be equally difficult. Um, so one way that o the Office of Housing Stability tries to mitigate um, the lack or scarcity of legal assistance is through three different buckets. We have a financial assistance program, we have an eviction prevention program, and we also have a homelessness prevention program. Uh, through our financial assistance program, as you can imagine, we provide financial supports to constituents, upwards of $5,000 who are facing housing insecurity due to arrearages, utility costs, or cutoffs, or shutoffs, excuse me, or uh, for moving costs. Uh, so our financial assistance programs works in tandem with our other resources such as homelessness prevention but also eviction prevention uh, in that our homeless prevention program is more case management, hands-on support for constituents. As Chief Dillon mentioned, a lot of times tenants have difficulty navigating different resources in terms of when do I recertify? What documents do I need to put together? I need someone who can coddle this information to, for me and present it to a public housing authority. So our homelessness prevention program works with constituents who may have accessibility needs that warrant uh, more additional support. And then we also have our eviction prevention uh, program where we work with uh, colleagues such as Greater Boston Legal Services, but we also work with the Eastern Housing Court uh, by having a housing court navigator uh, advocate that is in court three days out of the week on their busiest days, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, uh, where we, as, a, as the name implies, help constituents uh, navigate the court process. That could be landlords, that could be tenants, that could be uh, legal advocates, and making sure that they are connected to different resources, whether that's the state rental assistance program, whether that's our financial assistance program, or some other resources that uh, could benefit uh, whoever is, is court involved. Uh, However, I've said a lot, but despite all of these resources that we have pulled together, uh, there still seems to be and underscores the need for uh, legal assistance. Uh, that's the biggest gap, as I mentioned, in our services. And I really appreciate, again, uh, the space and the time to have this conversation and welcome further conversation. Thank you so much. Um, next is Head Ehrlich. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You have the floor. Um, First, I want to thank um, the councillor and city council for inviting um, us today to testify in front of you. It really, truly is a privilege and an honor um, to, to sit in front of such knowledgeable council and to share the a table with Chief Dillon and my our former colleague, Attorney Johnson. Um, I'm Attorney Ed Ehrlich. I'm the interim managing attorney of the housing unit at Greater Boston Legal Services. Greater Boston Legal Services have been providing has been providing legal services for low-income um, residents in Boston since the turn of the century with 120 years of experience. We are the largest provider of legal services in the city of Boston. Um, we work shoulder to shoulder with other provider of legal services such as law school clinics and uh, smaller, more sp specialized um, agency and legal services organizations as well as community organizers, social workers, 
um, and the entire envelope that is needed to help a family in such time of crisis. Um, in recent years, we are very lucky and fortunate to have um, the Office of Housing Stability and um, the Mayor Office of Housing working with us and assisting us um, both in handling cases and um, with awarding grants to Greater Boston Legal Services to do this work. Um, the need is higher today than I have ever seen it in my career. Um, rents are skyrocketing. Um, rental assistance is dwindling and insufficient to support the unreasonable rents that tenants are being extorted by their landlords. Our shelter system, our statewide shelter system, is imploding in front of our eyes, which means that children and kids, BPS students who are being evicted today do not have a shelter to go to tonight. Um, and families are at risk of spending very cold nights on the streets without any support of the statewide shelter, which is effectively closed. I know OHS and Danielle Johnson is doing whatever they can, but this is really where the, where the state um, had failed us, and the need is, is extremely high for families facing evictions. We at Greater Boston Legal Services, with all the support we're getting, can only represent a fraction of the people who are calling us for help. I always say I have 5,000 people waiting outside my door, and I cannot help them. On a regular basis, our attorneys and our intake people have to apologize and send people away. Even people that we do assist, more often than not, we can only provide them with legal advice. And we then send them with, with their answer to court where I know they're going to get steamrolled by the hostile environment in the housing court, the judges, the mediators, and opposing counsel. This is this is really is um, really is heartbreaking, and this is really why we truly need a statewide access to counsel, and why we really need the support from the city to make it um, a reality. We see on a regular basis, pe regular basis, people who are calling us, even if referred from to us by Danielle and her and her folks, after they have already signed an abusive agreement for judgment in court. And the only thing I can tell them is there isn't much I can do, if at all. Um, people are giving away their basic rights. A person who is evicted for no fault just because some investor purchased their house and would like to turn it into a middle class housing instead of the working class that used this property for, for, for decades. People are being evicted for no fault. They have a legal right by the legislature statutory right to ask the judge for up until one year if they're, if they're elders or disabled of the stay of execution, even if they lose their case, just because they were evicted for no fault of their own. People don't know that. Or even if they do know that, they don't know how to assert it. And they signed an agreement for judgment that requires them to move out within two or three months. They think they, you know, they think they got, they got out easily because they were told by by the landlord's attorney that they could get, they would be evicted within a week or two if they don't sign. They think they got a good deal. They just, people give away their rights because they don't have an attorney. And even if they try to assert the right in front of a judge without my staff attorneys, they routinely fail at that. Um, housing court is not, this is the place where Unrepresented people come to court, and the housing court can, does not know how to handle those. We really need um, everything we can do to increase full representation for tenants. Um, we are seeing all of our attempts to provide less than full representation by an attorney, um, either representation by um, student attorneys or limited appearance attorneys being curbed by the court, being limited in scope of what we can do. So we really feel like the need is high and we cannot do 
our work without further support from the state. And um, we're lucky to work in Boston where we do get meaningful support from the city, but um, we can barely make a dent in, in the problem as we see it. Um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, we've been joined um, by uh, Councillor Santana and Councillor Pepin. I also have a letter of absence from my colleague, Councillor Durkin. Uh, I wanted to extend my regret at my absence from this hearing. I'm attending community office hours in the Fenway neighbourhood of my district. Unfortunately, um, I, I am unable to attend today's hearing. Please extend my uh, congratulations to uh, Councillor Weber for continuing his important work outlined in this maiden speech. That's Councillor Durkin. And we also have um, also been joined by uh, Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Okay, so. Um, would open it up for some questions to the panel. Uh, you'd like to start, uh, uh, Councillor Weber? Uh, yeah, uh, th th thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I guess Director Johnson, you know, uh, um, you, you worked as an attorney in housing court. Uh, I guess, could you, for, for, for the council, for any folks watching, just briefly just walk us through what the eviction process would look like, including like it's, the, it's called summary process and what that looks like for a tenant and how sure. long that would take. Sure. So in Massachusetts, and Massachusetts has a very robust housing law, which is great. Um, so first is the notice to quit that a tenant receives. It could be uh, for any of those three categories that I mentioned for non-payment, for fault or no fault. Each carries with it a certain time frame that you have to give the tenant to respond. For instance, a notice to quit for non-payment is a 14-day notice to quit, or it can be more if the uh, tenant is in uh, subsidized housing, but the, the base is 14-day notice. Or there is a 30-day notice, which is usually for fault or no fault. Uh, so after that time has lapsed, either the 14 days or the 30 days, sometimes it can be even more than 30 days, the tenant then receives a um, summons and complaint from a constable or a sheriff. Um, and then from, that, from there, they are given a date to come to housing court. Uh, and the housing court now has a tiered uh, system and, and um, attorney Ehrlich can speak more to this given he's currently uh, practicing. But uh, there's a first tier, which is usually the mediation. And that's where most agreements are signed and where a lot of tenants uh, lose a lot of their, their rights. Uh, and then after the first tier mediation, if the case is resolved, Sometimes great, sometimes not so great. Uh, and then after the first tier, if the case is not resolved, then it goes on to other processes within the housing court. That could be through pretrial, that could be an actual bench trial, it could be a lot of motions before you even get to um, having a uh, your day in court, uh, so to speak. So there's a lot of different steps that you have to go through. And a lot of what our office does is try to walk tenants through that process, understanding that we aren't Although, although I'm an attorney, but not in that capacity, understanding that we can't give legal advice, so more so giving them high level, you can expect to receive this type of document. Then after this document, you can expect that document. One major issue that we run into, uh, which is why access to counsel is so important, is even at the initial stage, a notice to quit stage, tenants think that they have to vacate. Uh, and we are always proponents. It's in our email signatures that only a judge can evict you. But we see a lot of times uh, that tenants think that, oh, I've received this notice. That must mean that I have to leave right away. Uh, so a lot of our messaging to tenants is, wait, don't go anywhere. You actually have more time than you think. Uh, and that's where uh, we connect with Greater Boston Legal Services or invite them to our legal clinic where we're able to have one-on-one -on -one communications with constituents and an attorney. So that's the, the process of an of a eviction case, more or less. Yeah, and I, I just, I, I, if I didn't say so already, I just want to thank uh, you for your hard work and Chief Dillon. I think the Office of Housing Stability is you know, uh, providing a, an incredibly important service uh, for our residents. And you know, I, I, I thank you for all your hard work. Uh, uh, so it, to me, as a, as a civil litigator, you know, my cases last years, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it, my sense is it's a very, <laughs> you said 14 days from the notice to quit. Mm -hmm. Like, what is a typical, you know, time between somebody who receives the notice to quit until and, and they're, right. 
you know, because almost nobody gets to a trial, but uh, to the time that they right. they have an order from the court right. kicking them out. I don't know, had, oh. or Attorney Earl, if you want to take that one. Sure. Um, so it, it, it would depend on, on, on the type of notice, but a uh, notice, let's say a 30-day notice would expire at the end of that 30 days, and then the landlord can file the eviction action in court within, usually within the 30 days, that would be the first tier or the mediation, as Attorney Johnson said, and if it's not resolved at that mediation, it will move to trial, which is two weeks later. So we are talking um, about two months now that the process is, is slightly longer than it used to be. Okay, but yeah, if you don't mediate, you get two weeks uh, to prepare for trial, which... You get two weeks, you get limited discovery rights if you know to ask for discovery. Um, and most people obviously do not know um, that they have the right to ask their landlord question and, and information and documents so they can even prepare for trial. Okay, thanks. I, I, I just, uh, checking in with the chair, I don't want to... Uh, take other people's time. Um, I, have, I, have, I have a couple more questions. Yeah, you're the lead sponsor, you ask the questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, thanks, I'm new to this. Um, so I mean, maybe this is uh, for you, uh, Attorney Ehrlich. Um, you know, what, what kinds of, there's counterclaims, I think uh, Director Johnson re referenced uh, counterclaims. What sort of counterclaims do people have and do you, would you expect someone without an attorney to be able to bring those counterclaims? So a, a counterclaim in, in summary process case, um, there is a statutory right to use a counterclaim as a defense to the eviction. So for example, um, if, if a person is being evicted for um, non-payment or for no fault of their own, um, they can f put as a counterclaim the fact that the landlord mishandled their security deposit, which is a very common um, lease viol uh, statutory violation, um, that landlords just don't handle the security deposit that they charge the tenant um, as the law requires, which um, provide the tenant three times the amount of the security deposit in attorney's fees. Um, if, and then they could simply just by asserting this violation and uh, this counterclaim defend not only prevail and get money damages, but also prevent the eviction and stop the eviction from happening. Um, those counterclaims could be in technical violations such as um, security deposit that I mentioned, but also um, very important claims that a tenant could have against their landlord, such as discrimination, retaliation for asserting their rights, um, etc. So. Um, so tenants have the right to assert it if they file their answer on time. Um, a lot of them don't know they have the right to assert it, so they don't assert it on time, and then they can only assert those counterclaims um, if allowed by a judge upon motion, um, which is the non-lawyers in the crowd probably say, what is he talking about? That's what our unrepresented tenants feel like when they're saying, oh, you have, you can, how, raise your counterclaims upon motion, and but you don't have a right to it. It is so confusing to so many tenants. Um, yeah, that that is what I saw when I was in housing court, and I, I, I expected the judges to show some leeway to folks who didn't have an attorney, or you know, uh, and instead it was the opposite. <laughs> um, which is that your experience or your your attorney's experience in housing court? Our experience is that unrepresented tenants do not get a fair shake. Yes. Um, sure, I just have one last question, sorry. Chief Dillon, I guess, um, if somebody is evicted right now, you know, um, what, uh, you know, are, are they more likely to, you know, end up homeless? What, 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 what do we have, what does the city have, or all the, sh we hear a lot about the shelters being full. Can you just address that? We don't have any exact data on if some if a family or an individual gets evicted, where they go because it happens, they scatter. We, we, there's no data collection, but anecdotally, um, shelters, as was mentioned, are full. Our family shelters in the state are full. There's a wait list. Maybe they can get into a congregate shelter. Um, more often than not, they um, 
as, as Councilor Murphy mentioned, they go into with family or friends or situations that are not good. They're overcrowded or they're not safe or so they're, they're doubling up and that's really, really bad, especially for school aged children. So shelter now is not a certainty. Um, they're, they're going into crowded situations. We don't have any homeless families on the street, but we certainly have homeless individuals on the street. And if you, if you go out and you talk to them, you will, uh, you will meet individuals who were recently evicted. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's really just an awful situation. And if I could just add, and I'm, I'm stating the obvious, but for emphasis, like families or individuals that are evicted, that becomes a permanent, you know, that's on someone's record. And then as they kind of get the resources, uh, they cobble together first and last, and they go out looking for another apartment, their credit score is pretty much destroyed, and they have an eviction record now, making it so hard to find a new apartment. So it, there's just, there's so many uh, long-lasting bad effects uh, um, if you've been evicted. I, I know I'm, I know I'm telling you all what you already know, but so the situation there's not a good safety net, I guess to your point. There's not a good safety net like we've had in the years past just because we have a confluence of, of events, including a migrant crisis. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chief Dillon. Uh, Councillor Lumijan. Thank you, and thanks again uh, to this panel um, for everything that you've highlighted. Um, I do want to say how, uh, besides myself, I am by the, 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 the proposed SJC rule change to 303 that would limit the ability of student attorneys where I got my start, where Nicole, mm -hmm. Professor Nicole Summers got her start, that would limit our ability to represent people who already, where there's already such a power imbalance in housing court. And I think the testimony here makes it clear how much we need to do everything in our possible to sort of equal that power balance. So. I'm just really disappointed that there isn't any attempt to strip away the limited opportunities that people already have to offer representation. Um, at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, every Friday I ran an eviction clinic where we would help people answer those, uh, provide answers to the summary process that would, for example, being able to retain uh, your right to a jury trial, which is important as a logistic process in the summary process, uh, uh, throughout the summary process process, uh, but also, you see housing court as a venue for people who often, often aren't able to assert their rights, whether it be to the substandards of living or violations of warranty of habitability, that they're able to actually do that through this process and not only save their home and remain stable, but also acquire access to dignity affirming housing for the first time via this process. So I just wanted to say that um, I'm really upset and I really hope that the SJC does not go forward with this rule change that would be disastrous for our communities. Um, my question uh, is for uh, you, Head, and, I, and then it's, I have a question uh, for the city of Boston, for the chief and director. Have you done an analysis to see, a GBLS ever done an analysis to see, of the percentage of intakes that you get, how many of those intakes lead to full representation in the housing context? Um, not in recent years, but we are about to embark on what we call a turnaway survey on April 1st. So I'll be happy to report once, once that is concluded. But unfortunately, uh, we were not very good at recording who are the people we, we turn away. Um, you can imagine they are not very happy to share a lot of information after they're told they cannot be assisted. But um, I'm hoping to get some more, um, that we can get some a better idea of who are these people that we have to turn away. Thank you. And when, when you think about the service providers in this area for people who are low income, indigent, otherwise wouldn't be able to find um, attorneys, there's really you, GBLS, there's the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau, there's MLRI. Does MLRI do individual case representation? No. Not, not currently. Um, there's some support from the Volunteers Lawyer Lawyers, Project yeah, yeah. and Northeastern Law School have, um, have a clin has a clinic, and so does I think BU BC. And BC, BC. Um, different, but they all cover different um, areas of Greater Boston. Okay. Um, and and Legal Services Center also part of Harvard. Law right, Legal Services Center. And can you, uh, you you said you alluded that perhaps in the past there w there was. Uh, research or analysis of the percentage of cases or that were taken to full representation. Do you have a sense of what, I know that you said it doesn't start until April 1st, but do you have a, a, a rough sense right now 
So, uh, well, I, I do have um, data on how many cases we mark as um, advice or limited service compared to how many cases we are able to take in full representation. Um, it is hard for me a little bit to tell which one is an eviction case and which one is not, but about 20% <coughs> of the cases we take, we, uh, we, can, we are able to provide um, full representation and about 80% of them we are only able to provide an advice or 80%. help with, with drafting the pleadings. Um, and then we're sending them to housing court to fend for themselves. Do you run an eviction clinic, something like that, where where folks facing eviction before they are their court date can come in and help and, and, and you help them fill out an answer? Or does it happen in that way? We yeah. provide for those people. We usually do it one on one over one -on -one. Zoom now because mm -hmm. technology is so much um, easier than it used to be. So we don't have to bring people to our office to spend a few hours. Yeah. But we do staff um, the the legal clinic that um, the Office of Housing Stability is having every Tuesday night. Okay, um, I ask this question because you know myself as a as a former housing attorney now in this role as an at large city councilor. I can tell you that one of the questions we all get, most as city councilors, is one about housing, is that I have, you know, uh, remember the number for Age Lab, 617-495-4408 for you, 617-371-1234. It's the first place I turn if I get someone who is facing eviction, I turn them to GBLS. And sometimes my, I, I get uneasy about that because I'm thinking about what is the likelihood that they will be able to get even services or to get some level of representation. Um, so that's why I ask those questions because, you know, maybe we're not able to follow up every, you know, fully with a constituent who calls, but this is why I care about right to counsel and access to counsel so that I know that when I give them these phone numbers that I can feel confident that I've prevented a displacement and we don't feel that and I think that's why right to counsel is important. So is, is my time up? So just a quick proviso um, as part of our relationship with OHS, every person who's being referred to us by the Office of Housing Stability, we talk to them. An attorney would talk to, will talk to them. So if you want to refer someone to the Office of Housing Stability and they ref end up referring them to us, we will talk to them. That is part of our agreement, even if we cannot provide them with full representation. Thank you. And then I have one, uh, my, my question to Chief Dillon and to Director Johnson. Director Johnson, you know I think that you are the bomb.com <laughs> and the work that you do <laughs> is incredible because we do refer people to you all the time. Um, is what does that look like financially from the city, that partnership with GBLS, that referral? Because if we know that, you know, Head said that we're not even making a dent, we're not even making a dent and we realize the gravity of the situation, what is that finding? What is the current financial commitment to the city in partnership with GBLS or any of the other organizations that are doing direct services to address this problem? Where is the funding? What does the funding look like in the budget, you know, that we're going to get on April 10th? Um, so that we know, and so that we know where we can sort of uh, fight and buttress so that yeah. folks have access to counsel. Do you want to go over the budget with GBLS? Yeah, if you want to talk overall. So, yeah. um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Yeah. I, um, I believe we have a contract, a yearly contract with GBLS for about $500,000, and it funds uh, two full-time attorneys and two paralegals. Three attorneys. One three para, okay. Three, para, three attorneys and two paralegals or one yeah, paralegal? One paralegal. Three okay. attorneys and two paralegals. Yeah. All right. So, four legal personnel, yeah. um, right? So, and I, I think we were all in agreement that um, we do refer a lot of a lot of uh, families over to GBLS, and um, I, if we think about that, there were five thousand court filings last year. Um, like I said, over a little over nine hundred ended up being uh, granted executions. Um, it's it's not enough. Right, it's it's not enough. We don't have enough citywide. We don't right how have enough programs in the state to really represent or make sure that everyone's getting the legal representation they need. I don't know. If, please, Danielle, add to that if you like. No, I I would agree with that. I think um, even adding from our last fiscal year, adding on an extra attorney because we saw that gap still wasn't sufficient, and we're we're going through a current um, RFP process where we're trying to figure out. What can we actually afford? And to Chief Dillon's point, it's just surmountable. Like it's just unfathomable how much this would actually cost to 
ensure that everyone had an attorney to speak to or someone to walk them through how to file an appropriate court document. Thank you. I'll, uh, I know my time is up. I'll come back. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, thank you, Director. Um, I, I know the, the Office of Housing Stability does incredible work. I, I, we refer people there all the time. So can you tell us just very briefly, you know, the, you have legal office hours for ten, on tenants' rights. We, we, we refer people to go and go to the, the office hours. And then also, do you offer um, consults for small landlords who need some guidance on how to avoid uh, yes. the need for eviction in their cases as well? Yes, and, and thank you for that reminder. When I was going through the services that we provided, I was like, there's things I'm missing. Uh, but yes, we do provide landlord mediation services through uh, a nonprofit organization called Just to Start. And we use them in instances which you just described where tensions are high, but landlord isn't wanting to go to, to housing court. So we're able to step in and say, why don't we just have a out of court, no filings, no documents. Uh, agreement where both parties are happy, to some degree as, as happy as you can be in those types of situations. And then uh, the legal clinic that we run is every Tuesday from 5.30 to 7, uh, where we have one of those uh, landlord mediators present, but also have attorneys from Greater Boston Legal Services. And then once a month, we also have uh, an attorney from the Volunteer Lawyers Project who can provide uh, the legal counsel for smaller landlords. Thank you. Sure. It's really amazing, and I do appreciate um, just how it's like emptying the ocean with a tin uh, cup. <laughs> um, Chief um, Dylan, uh, you know, in terms of the unmet need, like, have you got a sort of a ballpark figure of how much if we, how much it would cost to to do this? Um, I don't. I know that, and I'm. <clears throat> Ned Duke is here, and I know that, um, and maybe GBLS would have um, uh, like a per case. Like, what would a what would an average representation on a per case? Um, um, what would it cost? And I think um, uh, Mass Law Reform has looked at those numbers. Um, it, we're we're talking millions and millions of dollars, certainly. Um, you know, this is where I'm out of my expertise because I'm not a I'm not a lawyer. But like, how much would some cases are going to be very you know very involved and they're going to take a lot of legal hours and some of them can be resolved more quickly. So what is the average? So I don't feel like I can speak to speak to that number. But I know when we do back of the envelope, we're talking tens of millions of dollars. Thank you. The other question you mentioned, I think it was con um, Chief Dillon, you mentioned. Uh, one of the reasons why people get into trouble uh, and face eviction is uh, an issue with recertification of vouchers. Can you speak to that issue? Because I know we have we have had some issues with this recently in our office. Yeah, it's um, it's it's frustrating because um, you know it, th that is a situation with the right supports tenants can provide. So if you are if you uh, are living in a unit that it has a project based voucher or you yourself have a mobile voucher either a section 8 or an MRVP you have to do a, a yearly certification. And oftentimes uh, tenants for whatever reason sometimes it's mental health issues sometimes they don't have the paperwork sometimes they're not being the the ask or the information or the request isn't clear. Um, fall behind on certifications. And if they fall behind on certifications, then they end up paying the fair market rent. Mm -hmm. And that adds up very, very, very quickly. So um, we really are starting to work with management companies saying, how can we do your request around certification? Is there an incentive or is there a way that you're asking or is it language uh, that you're not, you're not asking in the, in, a, in, in the appropriate language? So we're really trying to work with management companies to figure that out. Why are so many residents not certifying annually? Uh, that we can fix, right? That doesn't have a big price tag to it. Uh, people get behind tens of thousands of dollars in their rent, that's more of a problem. But recertifications we should be able to solve. Yeah. I think it's finding that low-hanging fruit, so the things that are easy fixes, and then addressing the bigger issues. Uh, thank you. Um, Councillor Murphy? Thank you, John. And thank you always to my colleagues. They ask good questions, or I won't repeat them. Um, but one thing when we're looking at how this hearing order was written and it's asking to consider a pilot program and Council of Braden asked questions that kind of touched on what would that mean and how much would it cost and um, one question I have and it may be 
through the chair to the lead sponsor what his thoughts were or what you as the experts think would this be supporting in funding you know more for your services at GBLS to give more support or what were you thinking a city department working alongside our legal department that's already here like what thoughts were we having going forward if we wanted to have a pilot program we know it's expensive we know we're, we're spending a lot already right half a million dollars is already going to support legal services so and we know that there are other agencies out there obviously not enough but um, you know like mass legal health and law schools are also step up so not sure if I could ask through the chair to the sponsor what thoughts were Councillor Weber sorry <laughs> the W's <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, you know, I, I think this part of the hearing is part of the, the, the process where we can figure out, you know, what tools, you know, we can use uh, as we watch the state, uh, you know, whether they're going to support a program statewide, what we can do to support that, you know, if there's, uh, I think, that if the state, ha uh, and I, I think some of our uh, people on the second panel can address this, but um, you know, if the state has a, a statewide program that mandates you know, right to counsel, that will take years to implement. And right now, you know, we have folks who are uh, losing their homes without knowing what their rights are, and they're facing, you know, no, having no shelter. So uh, it's I, my my thinking about this is that we should figure out a way where. We can address a crisis here, uh, and you know, to the extent we can support the state's efforts, we should do that. Um, and you know, I, but I think this hearing process, and, and as we go forward to figure out, you know, what that would look like at the city level. But you know, so I don't have that answer because you know, I'm I'm learning ju just. I mean, maybe I, I, no, no offense. I assume we're learning together about this, yeah. uh, and. Um, you know, but I, I, it's, a, it's a question I've been asking myself and, and certainly uh, talking to the experts in the field. You know, I'm, I value their feedback and, I, you know, I think this is the beginning of that process. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I think one of the important reasons why we have hearings, too, is to, to learn. And so it has, even though we know there's a need just hearing these personal stories and the number of cases that you just can't get to even if you worked 24 hours a day. Um, so I, I'm empathetic to your work um, and the question was asked more like how to also support going forward. So this is obviously the beginning of the conversation but um, thank you for sharing what, what is needed. I think that helps. Right? Oftentimes I it's the political will when it's issues about schools and housing and these big issues we have to tackle on the council. If there isn't political will, you often don't get anywhere with it. So I do think this hearing will help move that and get people, you know, more motivated knowing that it's, you know, needed. So thank you for that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Murphy. Uh, I, I, miss, I, I, I said Contra Santana and then Councillor Pepin, or Councillor Pepin and then Councillor Santana. Yeah. Okay. Whoever was first, I could host. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just like to start by thanking Councillor Weber for um, sponsoring this because it's such an important topic that I mentioned yesterday at the meeting that is in, this topic is important to me because my family was evicted once. Mm. Um, so I know how, how impactful this is to a family. But thank you to, to the three of you for being panelists today. Uh, special thank you to, to Ms. Director Johnson, just because in my previous role, um, I know I remember working very closely when I would bring families to you that were facing eviction, and you always stepped up to the plate to help them, so thank you. Um, my question is regarding language access resources. Um, there's a lot of, you know, going through the eviction process itself is difficult. But then doing it as a non-English speaker is, <laughs> must be a different story. Um, so I, I would like to know what resources do you have in-house 
um, or partnerships um, mm -hmm. that are useful for families that don't speak English. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Councillor Pepin, and I'm still getting used to calling you <laughs> Councillor Pepin. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so we internally have staff that speak uh, lang different languages, but we also have the language line, of course, to provide uh, information to tenants in the language that they're comfortable with. And at, at our uh, legal clinic that I had mentioned, we also have Spanish uh, interpreters along with Haitian Creole interpreters. Uh, upon request, we can also get other uh, languages as well. Uh, for, I'll let Attorney Ehrlich speak to the court process and what that looks like, but <laughs> I think he'll agree that that process is equally daunting, especially if, you, if English is not your first language, because you have to know to request an interpreter that's not always readily available, but I'll, I'll stop there and, and let Attorney Ehrlich answer. Thank you. Um, so at at, again, at, at Greater Boston Legal Services, we have, at least on the, at the intake level, we can intake, we have staff who can intake in um, Haitian Creole, Spanish, Portuguese, um, Mandarin Cantonese, and Vietnamese, and oh, we all are very, we all use the, um, the, we have language line, and we have ASL service to speak with, um, uh, with people who are coming to us, either for advice or for representation. We also have attorneys who um, can speak multiple languages. In the courthouse, it is slightly different. Um, it's better now because when it was, during the pandemic, it was on Zoom and there was a notice in English that you can ask for an interpreter if you would like one. Um, now that it is in person, there are notices almost everywhere. Um, in multiple languages, the Babel um, notice that you can ask for uh, for an interpreter. A lot of people don't understand that this is an important right that they need to assert because um, yeah. they think they know enough English, um, and they don't, and that's you know heartbreaking. Um, often. People will be encouraged to use an interpreter and would refuse because um, they think they can handle it without one. But the court is getting much better at, as, at giving people the interpreter they need, I would say. But as any right, you have to assert it. And that's the biggest limitation that unrepresented people have. Well, thank you for that. Um, because of that language barrier, um, I also had a follow like a question related to that. To your knowledge, to the three of you, um, are there any specific tactics or practices that landlords use sometimes to kind of move towards an eviction so that pushes the tenant out um, without them trying to fight it? That, so that we can be aware of if we're ever in the community. Um, I think a lot of the times there would be some landlord's attorneys or some landlord who would provide information to the tenant that is somewhat misleading about the rights. Um, or they would provide them a piece of paper that is pre-printed and say, "How well, that's the agreement I'm offering. And they would come to court with an agreement with just filling the blanks. I hereby admit that I owe $4,000 and I will pay it in five installment of $1,000. And, and I also waive and release every right I have to sue my landlord from the first day of my tenancy until today. And, you know, and they sign it. And then a week later, they call and yell or me and say, what do I do? I signed it, but I can't pay. But I, can't, I cannot pay $1,000 a month on top of my rent. Um, can you help me? And sometimes we can, a lot of the times we can, and there are cases where, where, where we cannot. And, um, not, it's not just the language, it's the language, it's the culture, it's just complete imbalance of education. You see the landlord's attorney walking around, you know, saying hi to all the clerks, and you know, that person seems at home in court, and you're terrified. Yeah. Um, and people do sign terrible agreements yeah. on a 
regular basis. Even even more uh, more upstream, we will get lots of calls at the city and the Office of Housing Stability from families, and they are saying, um, "I just received a 14-day notice to quit. Can you help me find a new apartment?" And they really you, then you, you have to like back up and you have to say, "You don't need to leave. Only you know." But they just got a notice that says they have to leave, and they or it's not even for non-payment. You just have to leave. And they believe that they have to leave, and they've only got a, you know a handful of days. And those calls are un, unfortunately they're too common. So folks just get this notice, and they just don't know that they've got any any rights at all. So um, those calls are heartbreaking because some folks call us, and we can sort of set the story straight, or we can start giving them resources. But you can imagine how many people get that notice and feel like you know they don't call, they don't know to call, and they do indeed leave. I have one more question, and then it is, let's say an, an eviction does happen. Um, does the city have a, a list or a some sort of a partnership with houses that are available to families in case the eviction does go through? Um, I'm not, no, we don't have any notice that, uh, we don't have a list of, of uh, landlords that are saying, we put us on the list for those that have an eviction record. No, no, no. Okay, sorry. No, 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 like um, available housing that, oh. that you can potentially yeah. put the families that have been evicted to. I see. With. So, yeah, then, but they're, start, they're starting a process that's, as you know, yeah. is so competitive. If they're looking for affordable housing, there's wait lists. We're starting to redirect them to lotteries and then convincing if they are successful in those situations, uh, trying to mitigate the, the new eviction record, which we mentioned earlier, can be really, really damning when that people are out looking. So they have to start a process, you know, in, in a, and we've been talking a lot about it internally recently that uh, some of the, the families that are in the best position to, to secure a, affordable housing, especially, are those that are securely housed, right? They know where their paperwork is, they can think clearly, they can come home at night, cook themselves dinner, and then start filling out applications. If you are, if your life has been just, you know, uh, turned upside down, and your stuff is everywhere, and you're scrambling to get your kids, like, you are in such poor position to start, like, doing housing search. So we jump in, we try to help, but, um, it's it's just a, it's almost an impossible situation. That's why it's so important to save the eviction or even buy a lot of time so we can start in a more thoughtful way helping families relocate. If I may, Councillor Pippen, I think this is really really good question. Um, housing search in Boston has been the weakest link of the services we can provide. Um, it's been really hard find good organizations that help tenants with housing search. I know the OHS have is always trying to, to, to help people with, you know, matching them with services that can help them housing search. But I think we know all people who do it well by name. It's very few people who, are, who are, can effectively connect low-income people with, um, with housing search workers. One last comment, not a question. Um, just sitting here listening to you all, I became curious, and I, I Googled like City of Boston eviction rights, and the first thing that came up was the eviction guide, Boston.gov, and it says only a judge can order you and your family out of your apartment, mm -hmm. um, and that's bolded. So I guess a call to, to whoever does your communications and <laughs> to, to the counselors, I think this is something we have to start sharing more often. Um, because I, I mean, as savvy I think I am with city services, um, I don't often see that message a lot. So I, yeah. I'll do my due diligence there, Great. but to know that that exists is good. Yeah. Great. Great, thank you. So thank you for the work you all do. And again, thanks, thank you, Councilor Weber, for, for bringing this very important topic to the table. Thank That's, you. Thank you, Councilor Pepin. Councilor Santana, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, um, I just want to start by thanking Councillor Weber um, for uh, making right to counsel your first filing, and um, thank you to Councillor Breeden and, and Councillor Dujet for, for co-sponsoring. Um, this honestly would have been my first, uh, one of my first priorities um, um, to call for a hearing for, and I'm really honored to be here with you 
and um, our city council colleagues um, to make this happy. And I also want to thank um, our panelists today. Um, you know, and I, I've worked for both uh, Director Johnson and um, Chief. Um, and, you know, have done amazing work, and, and thank you for being here, Attorney. Um, you know, my team and I have talked to many community members in the past months about, you know, variety of housing issues, and it's quite consistent in those conversations that most people are shocked to learn that someone facing a housing court case wouldn't have access to legal representation um, if they can't afford it. Um, people are so familiar with public attorneys and our criminal legal system that it just doesn't occur to them that you know the kind of this kind of court case could limit whether someone has the right to attorney. Um, this is one of those issues that as soon as you um, hear the problem, it seems very obvious to to fix it. Um, and as noted um, by Councilor Weber earlier, in Massachusetts, court data shows that almost all landlords have hired lawyers for evictions. Um, and have hired lawyers for eviction cases in the, in the last few years, almost 90% of the time. Um, and that's up to 50% from just a decade ago. Um, and yet, at the same time, even as more tenants are coming to court with a lawyer than years ago, almost 90% of the time they still don't have a lawyer and are stuck representing themselves without any expert guidance. Um, this has completely predictable results, as, as we all know. And, why we're all here, um, you know, tenants without a lawyer trip up to make mistakes while trying to figure out um, their way through a complicated and stressful process, and um, then they end up being um, more, more evicted more often than not. Um, families and single mothers are kicked out on the streets more often. Kids have their education disrupted more often. Careers are disrupted more often. Um, people's lives are just disrupted more often. Um, and we end up with more homeless pe um, people on, on the streets, right, um, or people on house. Um, and in all, of, all of this costs, um, both morally and as a society, um, literal dollars to all of us. Um, we end up spending vastly more money on emergency services and intervention programs. Um, in fact, the Boston Bar Association found that full representation in eviction cases would save the state over $63 million um, annually. It would, call, it would actually cost, it would actually be cheaper for us to invest in preventing evictions than it is for, for us to keep paying to deal with all the uh, repercussions created because we haven't taken a simple, simple step of making sure that um, tenants have access to a lawyer. Um, anytime we can save tax, um, taxpayer dollars while also doing the right thing is a huge win in my book. Um, so that's why, um, so this leads me to my first question. Um, do we have data for the cost that the city of Boston, the, the, the cost to the city of Boston for services for people who end up evicted? Any? No, we don't. Um, I, there is a, a, the next panel, um, I'm just going to put her on the spot. Annette Duke did do some studies um, around right to counsel, um, access to counsel statewide, and did. Uh, there was a report done on what it would, what we could save statewide. But so, if you could, we don't have any specific information on Boston. But I think the next panel would be able to outline some of the cost savings to the state. No, oh, great. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate that. Um, my second question. No, I want to note that I recognize and respect that our discussion today is focused on developing a program to address eviction cases, and I agree that's a great place to start. Uh, but I do also want to uplift that those um, are not the only housing um, cases where people don't have a right to counsel and need to be able to pay to hire a lawyer themselves or otherwise are far too often forced to go without any guidance. Um, the same thing can happen in fair housing discrimination cases and um, it can happen when landlords aren't keeping up with legally required basic maintenance or pest control or living conditions aren't safe and it can happen in cases where landlords violate leases and, or even laws. Um, residents frequently end up suffering through these um, injustice alone. Um, and that leads me to my second question. Do we have a breakdown of the number of each types of case that's handled by the Mayor's Office of Housing Stability and by the GB GBOS that would help us understand where some of these gaps are? So we do have data in terms of how many cases we've referred to Greater Boston Legal Services, and we also have data related to how many evictions we've prevented. Uh, this fiscal year, uh, and they're based not just from the work that Greater Boston Legal Services has done, but other organizations that we work with. To your point, uh, it's not just access or rights to counsel or attorneys, it's also what kind of supports can we put in place. So that's part of our data analysis of did we provide financial assistance to this family, which in turn prevented them from having to go through the housing court process, or alternatively, were we able to find them 
better affordable housing so that they could move to another location without having to go through the court process to Chief Dillon's point of getting an eviction on their record. So we do have that data that we can share. Get to. Great. No, thank you. Um, and Chair, if I may, I just want to kind of put an, an, an example out there to see if you guys can, um, um, you know, answer it to the best of your ability. Um, I've been dealing, you know, I've been getting calls over the last few weeks about, you know, undocumented um, residents who are here in Boston um, who are now, um, you know, who found a place, a landlord, right, to rent them out, to rent them out a, um, a, a room. Um, and now they're giving them, you know, at, depending on the situation, but one of them in particular gave them a week to move. Um, but there's no documentation of anything signed, right? There's nothing, there's none of that. Like, what are the rights, um, or are there any rights here um, where people, especially with undocumented status, um, with no paperwork, with, you know, done with, with, with the landlord? Um, is there anything that, you know, we as the city of Boston or anyone over here, you know, that we can do to support that? So, um, just briefly, um, people with, regardless of uh, citizenship status, have the right, this, have similar rights in court. Um, and similar rights under the law when it comes to their relationship with their landlord. Um, at Greater Boston Legal Services, we represent people regardless of, citizen, of, of citizenship status, and I, and I know um, OHS does the same. Okay. Um, uh, concerning landlord-tenant rela relationships that are not documented with um, via a written lease, this is very common in low-income communities. Um, we see, you know, tenancy at will that can be terminated um, just as a, um, for no reason at all. Um, depends on this, depends on the, depends on the terms, on, on the kind of housing. Um, I would say the landlord or the owner has got to go through the court system in order to evict someone. Um, Self-help is how we refer to it in, um, in legalese, is illegal in Massachusetts. Landlord cannot just kick someone out. Um, if, that, if it does happen um, and there is an illegal lockout, this is something we can assist with um, in, or, um, or the Office of Housing Stability. But this is, um, this is a terrible situation that you're describing and this is people definitely have the right to go to court and prevent being displaced um, in such a way. No, thank you for the clarification. As you can imagine, as someone who was, you know, all, was undocumented at one point in my life as well, you know, even though even though those rights are clear, um, there's still a, a sense of fear, right, when it when it comes to it. And, and, yes, um, and a lot of our a lot of our undocumented um, clients tell us they're afraid to go to court. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's can I get picked up in court? And hmm. the answer to that is. Probably not, yeah. but I can't. There are no guarantees. Exactly. No, no. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Santana. Councillor Fernandez Anderson, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I guess, you know, just thinking about the um, idea before you in terms of possibilities, um, how can the administration, um, uh, I get, I guess what 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 would this look like in terms of actually you know addressing um, a pilot program? Is there are there possibilities? Um, and um, specifically, only because we you know if we contextualize it in terms of like who this impacts, um, we we know that this is like a very racial issue. Um, and so, like, how would the city go about creating something like this? And is it possible at all? Um, what's what's not possible, and please, any there's people here that are that have given this more thought than I have, and that are uh, lawyers. Um, but what we can't, what the city can't do without the state bill passing is require courts to recognize that tenants uh, should be offered an attorney, right? So. Uh, tenants will still go into court, like unless we pass, we the city of Boston, to the best of my knowledge, um, cannot um, come up with any kind of ordinance or 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 city ruling that says tenants have a legal 
right to legal counsel. Um, we, we need the state bill to pass to do that. So tenants would, even if, if we decided that Boston was gonna do a pilot program, tenants could still go into housing court and no judge will recognize that they are deserving or they're, they have, uh, that, they, that, that proceedings can't go, go forward without being offered uh, legal representation. So that's the, the flaw in anything that Boston does. What Boston can do and, and, and will continue to do, but provide more resources through area nonprofits to buy as much legal representation as we can. Um, and as we were talking about it earlier, it, given the price tag, it probably will be short. Um, but that's, I, that's my understanding of what we can do as a city. And maybe those resources could be targeted in a certain way or um, made available in a certain way or, or people could be informed in a certain way. But requiring courts to recognize, I do not believe we can do that. But I'm really open to anyone who has a different opinion. I mean, we're talking about a pilot program um, not necessarily changing the law. That law piece, we understand. Uh, we're on the same page. That's why we're here, and hopefully this turns into something else. Um, if it's a home rule petition or whatever the next steps are, leave that to the makers. Um, but I am asking specifically about what, what has the administration, considering historical context, you have the data, you understand this is a huge issue. The city's, um, our responsibility is to ensure the well-being of its citizens. Um, and so knowing that, and knowing that our mission, one of our goals is to create a resilient, equitable, transparent, inclusive city. Um, in that, in that, in, in, within, within those guidelines, um, what has the city done, or um, specifically, um, can you provide me with specific things that the administration has done um, to address issue, issues of eviction? Sure, so I can, I'll start and then I'll hand it over to my colleague. Um, so we, we do have an ordinance that requires uh, if tenants are getting notices to quit, uh, that information comes into the city and it's, it's extremely helpful. Uh, staff overseen by Kyle Ribadu goes through all of those um, notices. We reach out. Uh, to the tenant, we look for patterns as things happening in a certain building, are they happening in a certain neighborhood, is there a certain landlord that we're seeing doing more, more eviction notices than they should, and we're doing a lot of very proactive outreach. Um, uh, other than that, we are holding legal clinics with GBLS and we are funding uh, legal services uh, through GBLS and others, but I'll let Danielle speak to that. Yeah, and I, I I think in addition to what Chief Dillon mentioned, we also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, have homelessness prevention services. So we work with local nonprofits to do hands-on, whether that's housing search support or other types of uh, mitigating supports that would allow for someone to circumvent the legal process. Uh, so those are some of the ways that we've been able to provide, or the administration is providing support for uh, residents who are facing housing insecurity. And on top of that, we do have the financial assistance program, which we continue uh, to operate the tenant stabilization fund, which provides arrearages support, utility shutoff support, and moving cost support for uh, constituents. So trying to group these multiple things in different buckets uh, in an effort to um, mitigate the, the scarcity of legal assistance that we're seeing, understanding to Ch uh, Chief Dillon's point that the amount that it would cost would just, you know, we don't have the infrastructure for that, and nor do we have the authority. Um, but could there be a pilot program, and you're saying it's too expensive, even if it's just saying providing legal services, it's too expensive. Not that we are saying this is binding. We have we're telling you that this is, that people have a right to counsel. So, I without the law, um, you couldn't say that. But you could provide services through nonprofits. Right. You could provide services out otherwise. But you're saying just a pilot program itself would be too expensive. Right. Well, I, th I think it depends too on how big the pilot is, right? So if it was a relatively I mean, relatively small pilot, it would be less expensive. Yeah. But there's uh, 5,000 
cases go to court from Boston every year. Um, we were talking a little earlier about like what the average legal representation would cost. So it's 5,000 times X. So um, probably, um, I don't know. It's healthy. <laughs> it's healthy, 10 million plus. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of money. Yeah, I saw there was like, the city spent, what, about $50 million in legal counsel so um, the past year. So we, there's a, it's a lot of money. Um, but to carve out 10 million for something like this would be too much. Um, you know, I think we're about to enter a budget uh, discussion, so mm -hmm. um, I'll be, we can we can certainly discuss it as part of the budget. I, I don't have the the I don't have um, information on the whole budget and what's available and what's not. But um, I know that we have to keep we have to keep our uh, legal services program funded and going. I think as we enter into a time where evictions are on the rise and rents are on the rise, that we probably th we need to th we don't ha we need to think about ways to expand it uh, and work with more more nonprofits because even GBLS right now, um, if we were, we were to provide additional funding, I know that capacity their capacity too is an issue. So the nonprofits are all having capacity issues. So I don't want to sound like a defeatist, and I look forward to expanding services, but it, you know it's it's going to be challenging. But yeah. Um, I will also ask the, Sorry, the, 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 lead, the lead sponsor to Sorry, is that um, my time? Um, to answer you, the, the lead sponsor. Oh, okay. I just, okay. I, I just yeah. Councillor Fernandez Anderson. Um, uh, there is someone on the next panel who uh, uh, Annette Duke who can address uh, costs and and what we can do also. Um, so you know, I think this is a question that uh, you know can also be addressed on the next panel. Okay. Um, so I, I just and there are so we're also going to hear from uh, people who run the uh, right to counsel programs in Philadelphia. Am I am I allowed to ask though? Can you, I keep going? You, I just well, have one more question. That's just for the chair. I just wanted to let you know that there will be someone on the next panel. I really to wanted to ask it from them though. Is that okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, so I guess it's envisioning something small. Could you see like practically logistically, um, Chief? Could you see us starting with something small here in the city? Sure, and I think we you know. I think we have a good uh, program right now, and it is it is small. I think uh, what we what we need to do, I think, in preparation or post this conversation, is um, drill down on what our grants with uh, GBLS and, and other legal institutions. What is it buying? Right. We know we're buying staff. I think we need to work with GBLS now and understand how many. Um, households are being assisted, and then sort of look at uh, the trends in, in eviction cases and sort of see what, what the numbers are telling us. So I think we've got some more work to do based on this conversation. Thank so. you. What roles do you see community organizations or advocates playing in something like this, if, the, if we were to do it? Yeah, so I, I think working with nonprofits is made the most sense for the Office of Housing Stability. And I don't want to talk for Danielle, she knows what she's doing. Um, so we have nonprofits that are doing housing search, we have nonprofits that are cutting checks for rent to rearages, we have nonprofits that are doing mediation uh, and uh, mediation, we have nonprofits that are providing legal services. And we have really good nonprofits in the city, so I think we've been able to be a bit nimble and buy the services that we need based on what we're seeing and the calls that we're receiving. Danielle, I don't know if you have any more. To yeah, no, I, I think what the chief mentioned is correct. I think a lot of what we try to do with our selection of different nonprofit vendors is making sure that we're looking at the gaps in our services. So for instance, we've recently seen an influx of elders uh, being faced with housing insecurity. So our next request for a proposal, we're looking at vendors that can provide that specific type of support. Uh, and also we do a really good job within the office of educating our vendors so that people don't always have to think that they have to call the city uh, in order to get information. So we hold quarterly different information sessions of these are tenants' legal rights, this is what you should watch out for. We even have Greater Boston Legal Services come in to do a training of if your client shows you this type of document, you should go to the court right away or you should call Greater Boston Legal Services right away. So I think that part of the service delivery, we're doing really well in analyzing where our gaps are. Uh, and to, the, to Chief Dillon's point around you know, what a pilot would look like, I think it requires a lot of conversation and a lot of looking at data and analyses and understanding you know, what types of cases even require 
uh, an attorney, uh, and that's working with Greater Boston Legal Services, BLP, a lot of our panelists that are here today, and then also assessing the cost aspect. Uh, and that, I think, <laughs> will be later down the road, but I do think initially it's figuring out because it's just a lot of intricacies related to summary process, so trying to figure out what people actually need before we go into, okay, we are gonna put this amount of money and it may not even be beneficial uh, given the need, so. Thank you. I think you answered partly of what I was gonna ask next in terms of, you know, beyond your community uh, collaborations and trainings and clinics, um, have you, will you be investing funds into some sort of campaigning to give uh, more community access? Um, linguistically, culturally appropriate types of like digital ads or campaigns, ways of really reaching people. Mm -hmm. People are on social media, they're on their apps, right? Mm -hmm. Just really creative ways of getting to people beyond just, if I didn't go to clinic, or mm -hmm. if I didn't go to food pantry, I didn't see the information, or I didn't, if I wasn't in trouble, I didn't seek the information. How do I learn that this exists and how do I access it? Yes, definitely, and uh, Councillor Pepin also uh, brought up the point that Googling information was helpful, but I think you know we definitely have a great marketing and communications team who we're actively working with to make sure that information is being um, properly disseminated to different groups so that they understand it. But any, any future plans on campaigning and really like getting the information out in a larger set, in a larger way? Yeah, I, you know, I, we're on social media a lot. In fact, I say, this is so repetitive. Nobody's, gonna, nobody's taking notice anymore. Um, but I, I, th I think your point's very well taken. I think we can always do a better job of getting word out and using, you know, where are people getting their information from and are we really tapping into those sources? So I, I know time is short today, but I would love to, to follow up with some of you and just where, where are your constituents getting your information? What are you feeling that now in your own neighborhoods? And then we could really, you know, really start designing better outreach materials or venues um, based on what we're hearing from you. I mean, I, and I mean that sincerely. You're on the ground. You know what people are using to get through information, especially city information. So I would really welcome that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, just before this panel leaves, um, our two other lead sponsors have a, one or two questions, just quick, quick questions. Uh, um, Councillor louis -Jean, did you want to have a question? Oh, I just wanted to, I think we left off when I was talking to Ed and you were we were talking about how uh, Director Johnson mentioned that 80% of the cases, well, all of the cases, when you have a case, you refer a case to GBLS. And then of the cases referred to you at GBLS, 80% of those are people you, you t they talk to an attorney so there's 20 percent all, all of them talk to the to an attorney all of them talk to an attorney mm -hmm. what's the 80 percent number um that's a general number of cases that we do not provide full representation in court okay so all of the for all the ones who talk to an attorney is there a is there a resolution that do all of those cases, do, is there a resolution in all of those cases? Or do you follow them to know whether there's a resolution that leads to non-displacement? So you mean our referrals from OHS? So OHS sends over a referral. Yeah. So you talk, to, you talk to all of them, mm -hmm. even if you don't fully represent all of them. If, even in the case where you don't fully represent, yeah. do you know whether there's a resolution where, ev where eviction is not the terminus, where it, it doesn't lead to eviction? So just, just to be clear. Every, Every person they send to us um, is being in fully intaked and then they get to speak to an attorney. Mm -hmm. Those are not necessarily eviction cases. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. work on, din um, let's say, anything that is related to displacement or uh, homelessness prevention, legal issues. So it will be access to shelter, it will be um, admissions to public housing, termination of housing subsidies. Mm -hmm. And obviously, the bulk of the work, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the bulk of the work is um, ev er, uh, eviction cases. Of the cases that are referred to us from OHS, there is a certain percentage where the case, practically speaking, is over. Right. Mm -hmm. So Danielle refers to as a case where the person, as I said, already signed an agreement for judgment. There is no real need for us to provide full representation. Um, so of the cases that are referred to us where the case is in a posture that we can actually provide full representation, um, I don't have off the top of my head what 
the share of those that we provide for representation. Um, is that something you can pull out of the Salesforce? Uh, we may have that. And yeah, we can, okay. we can follow up okay. with you. Um, yep. We. Okay. We really provide robust reporting on each and every case that is mm -hmm. referred to us, and right. um, so. Yeah, and, and I realize that some of these cases, it, maybe they're at the stage where rental assistance is enough, or there's something else, or agreement for judgment, it's counseling, or whatever else is necessary. But just want to give a, get a sense of like how much of a gap in need that there still is. So I would say every case that is we get in where the posture is right legal posture is right for us to enter an appearance mm -hmm. and there is good legal merit, right. we probably take all of these cases. Correct. Yep. Yep. Okay. You Thank you. And then I just wanted to make a comment. You know, I, I can appreciate the jurisdictional issues yeah. that present with creating something or working on something that provides for access to counsel for people on a citywide basis and a court not recognizing that there's that right. But I do think that there are ways in which we intervene all of the time, right? There's attorney for the day where folks and tables are there. There are ways that you could have canvassers or organizers when summary process is out, giving notice to people, right? Like we did that on the foreclosure level with yeah. on Saturdays where project no one leaves. Even with these jurisdictional limitations that the state is not going to recognize if the city were to do a, a, a an access to council model, and I'm, I'm eager to hear from other cities because I know that while we have limited home rule authority here, I'm sure that we're not the first city. There are other cities that have these programs, and I'm sure there are jurisdictional issues that present themselves there. And so in that sense, I don't think we're going to be a unicorn. But I think that even if legally or technically there are jurisdictional issues between the city and the, and the state, there are, and I, and I know, and there's no part of me that is saying that it would be an easy task. Actually, it would be rather difficult. But I do think that there is, um, there are means to logistically intervene in the court setting, prior to a court setting, to, to let enough people know that you have a right to counsel if you've received, if you're going through an eviction, right? The tables at court, well, meeting people in, the, in front when they're going inside, such that we could be so disruptive that the courts would have no other obligation but to recognize that they are not seeing tenants but if they are not represented by counsel. So I do think that like there are jurisdictional, and I, and I think it's the two-legged, the, we have a two-pronged issue. One is a jurisdictional question, and then there's another question about the f financing of it, which is like bonkers, right? But I do think that if finances weren't an issue, mm -hmm. if we had the money to fund it, the jurisdictional issue, we would figure out how to deal with that. I think points well taken. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Weber, do you have one last comment or question, and then we'll move on to the next panel? Yeah, yeah thank you. It, it, it's more of a comment, but uh, uh, you know, as a, somebody who worked in legal aid uh, for Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, um, you know, uh, Greater Boston Legal Services is one of the most highly regarded uh, legal services providers in the country, and uh, I, you know, I, I don't want any of this today to make people think otherwise. You know, I think uh, the, the city is definitely reaching out to the right place, and that you know, people in the city are, are very lucky to have an organization like GBLS. Just uh, Attorney Ehrlich, you, you, I think you highlighted what is part of the problem without uh, an access to counsel program is uh, you, you, you can only, 80% of the people you don't represent who you get referred to by OHS, um, and part of that is because people don't even know their rights until after they've gone to court, sign an agreement. Is, do, do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's why, you know, I think part of the issue here is we talk about outreach and these, th 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 this would be great, uh, but you know, uh, to, to not have the access in court, you know, somebody would have to know about OHS, They'd have to know mm -hmm. about programs mm -hmm. like this to make the necessary outreach before they went to court to have a meaningful right uh, and, act, and, and enforce their, you know, have a, have a chance to enforce their rights. Whereas, you know, I, th I think that's a, that's a flaw in the system and, and, and hopefully we can address that. So uh, again, thank you very much. Back to the chair. Councillor Santana. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just one last one. I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I have, and it's actually for, it's, it's, for, it's directed at you, Chief. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that the City of Boston receives information about eviction cases and looks for patterns or other indicators of unusual numbers of evictions from particular landlords or management companies. 
this is kind of a two-part question. What's normal for an eviction rate, and what would be abnormal um, that would catch your attention? And do we have a data? Um, do we have data on the kinds of landlords or management companies that are more typically, um, you know, typical filing evictions against tenants? I'm wondering what additional education opportunities we might have for both <coughs> tenants and lord landlords, depending on the types of um, um, of landlords involved. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to get back to you on the percentage of, of what we see that's average. I, we do have that, and so we sort of say, is someone below that average or above that average in kind of a crude way? And it's, it's the number of eviction action against their portfolio, right? So you have to understand their, the number of units in their portfolio. So I, I will get you that. Um, like I mentioned, when we, do see, um, when we do see large number of evictions coming from a particular building, management company, we are contacting them and we are doing education. Do you know about RAF? Do you know about our financial assistance? Um, what are you doing to reach out on recertifications? Like what's going on in your building? Do you have a, do you have a, uh, a building manager who might not uh, be following uh, you know, our eviction plan? When we fund affordable housing, I should just mention this and then I'll, I'll wrap, but when we fund affordable housing projects, we require an eviction prevention plan as part of, if you want our money, you're, putting, you're telling us how you're going to keep evictions to a minimum. And it's really, it's been, it's been a, one, it's a good tool for them to go through, right? We're going to do this, this, and this, but it also is opening up dialogue. And what I've found is uh, many times even very sophisticated, sophisticated management companies don't know all the resources that are available to them. So it's, it's been good, and, I, and they also know that we're collecting the data, and uh, that's helpful, too. That's helpful, too. But I will get you back the percentage. Thank you, Chief. I okay. appreciate it. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, thank you so much for your time. And um, we have lots of um, ongoing conversation to have about this very important issue. Uh, in the interest of time, I know we have a, a, some panel of our new panel or I've got a, a time constraints. So uh, the next panel is uh, Professor Nicole Summers. Uh, Kadeem Morris, both of whom are joining us remotely. Uh, Annette Drake, who's a senior housing staff attorney at the Massachusetts Law Reform Institute. Eloise Lawrence, who is an assistant clinical professor of law, deputy faculty director, and clinic professor of the law faculty director at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. Uh, Joseph Joe um, Ragusa. Sorry, I mispronounced your name, Joe. And Heather Gordon, who's a tenant, um, a tenant advocacy tenant from Roxbury. So, um, who we've got? Annette, Eloise, uh, Joe. Do you want to come up? Here he comes. Uh, moving right along, as we're getting settled, uh, in the interest of time, um, we'd like to start with uh, Professor Nicole. Uh, Summers, who's joining us from Georgetown University via Zoom. Welcome, Professor Summers. She's here. She, she's been here. She just. Uh, Professor Summers, you have the floor. Can we hear you? Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Council President Louis Jen, I've never called you that, um, and the entire Boston City Council. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Nicole Summers, and I'm currently an Associate Professor of Law at Georgetown University Law Center. Uh, prior to joining the Georgetown Law Faculty in 2022, I spent most of my career representing low-income tenants who were facing eviction in Massachusetts. Um, I began doing so as a student attorney at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau while a student at Harvard Law School with Council President Louis Jen um, under SJC Rule 303. I then continued doing so as an attorney at the Northeast Justice Center of Massachusetts and as a clinical instructor at the Legal Services Center of Harvard Law School and the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau. While I was working in Massachusetts, I was a member of the statewide right to counsel coalition that Chief Dillon referred to, working on and advocating for a statewide right to counsel in eviction proceedings. I'm here today primarily in my role as an academic researcher. I've spent most of my academic career researching eviction case outcomes, um, and most of my research has focused on the Boston Housing Court, formerly known as the 
formerly known as the Eastern Housing Court of Massachusetts. I want to begin by quickly summarizing what other academic research has shown about eviction, and then I'll tell you about what I've found in my own research. There are three main conclusions I want to highlight from other scholars' research on eviction. First, as uh, Council President Louis Jean and Council Councillor Weber have already mentioned, research has consistently shown that people of color, women, and families with children are disproportionately likely to experience eviction. Research, including research from Boston, has consistently found that race is the strongest predictor of a household's likelihood of facing eviction, even when income is taken into account. Black women with children are the most likely of any demographic group to be evicted. Evictions are a racial justice issue. Second, research has shown that eviction is extremely harmful, as Chief Dillon and others have already highlighted. Researchers have found that eviction causes homelessness, deepens poverty, leads people to move to housing in worse physical condition and in lower opportunity neighborhoods, leads to worse educational outcomes for children, and is associated with a host of adverse physical and mental health outcomes. Third, we know that access to counsel has a significant impact on outcomes for tenants facing eviction. Rigorous academic studies, some of which have taken place in Boston, have shown consistently that tenants who have legal representation in eviction proceedings are more likely to be able to stay in their homes. They're also better able to enforce their rights. Rights, for example, to get repairs made or to proper notice of legal proceedings when they have counsel. Now for my own research. For several years now, I've been working on a large study looking at the outcomes of eviction proceedings in the Eastern Housing Court. I've been working on this study in part with Justin Steele, Associate Professor of Law and Urban Planning at the MIT Department of Urban Studies and Planning. For this study, we randomly selected about 1,000 eviction cases filed in the Eastern Housing Court from 2013 to 2017. We retrieved and scanned the case files from the Housing Court, and then we manually coded the files to capture all available information about the case parties and outcomes. We created our own database of the case information because existing administrative data, the information that's available on mass courts, provides only a basic level of detail about case outcomes. So mass courts data does not, for example, provide information about the content of settlement agreements. The overarching goal of our study was to better understand the outcomes of cases overall in the Eastern Housing Court. Almost all cases in the sample involved unrepresented tenants. Only 4% of all tenants in the sample had full legal representation, and 1% of tenants had limited assistance representation. Our study was not designed to measure the impact of legal representation. As I mentioned, other studies have done that, and they've all found that legal representation for tenants makes a significant difference. What our study does is that it captures what the outcomes of the Eastern Housing Court are overall in its current state, where an extremely small, almost negligible percentage of tenants has counsel. So let me tell you what we found, and I'm going to now share my screen. So first, I'm showing you what the outcome, case outcomes are overall in the Eastern Housing Court. So to start, an extremely small percentage of cases actually go to trial. As you can see on the pie graph here, only about 4%. We found that landlords won 83% of these trials. Second, 15% of cases end in a default judgment. That means that in these cases, the tenant automatically loses the case. In other words, loses their home because they didn't appear in court. Third, 24% of cases are voluntarily dismissed. A voluntary dismissal could occur because the landlord didn't want to move forward with the eviction or because the tenant already moved out by the time the case got to court. Unfortunately, we have no way of knowing what the breakdown is between those two options based on the case files themselves. And finally, we have the most common outcome, which is a court-ordered settlement. Over half of cases settle. So what are the settlements? Well, we dug into those settlements and actually coded them to figure out what the terms are. We found that there are essentially two types of settlements. One third of all settlements are move out agreements. There are settlements that require the tenant to vacate by a specified date, by a specific date, and they are so ordered by the court such that they become legally enforceable court orders. If the tenant doesn't move out, the landlord has a right to execute an eviction through a constable or sheriff. Two thirds of settlements are what I call civil probation agreements. These are court-ordered agreements for judgment that award a judgment for possession to the landlord, but stay the execution, the actual eviction, for a certain period of time. 
During this time, the tenant is required to comply with certain conditions. These can be financial conditions or behavioral conditions. Things like repaying rental arrears, paying ongoing rent on time, or complying with additional behavioral rules. If the tenant complies with these conditions for the full probationary period, their tenancy is eventually reinstated. If the tenant violates any condition, however, they can be evicted through an alternative expedited legal process via a motion to issue execution. The vast majority of the substantive and procedural legal protections the Massachusetts legislature has enacted to protect tenants facing eviction do not apply in these motion proceedings. Tenants can be evicted swiftly and with very little process when they allegedly violate a probationary condition. My research into these agreements has revealed that one, the conditions these agreements impose are quite onerous. Second, that these agreements are quite long, on average about a year, and they almost always continue even after the tenant has fully repaid the rental arrears they owed. Three, that about a third of cases with these agreements come back to court on a motion to issue execution. So the tenant faces eviction again, just now through this expedited process. And four, when judges rule on motions to issue execution for alleged violations of these agreements, they almost uniformly grant them. My research shows that judges allowed 60, excuse me, allowed 96% of the motions to issue execution they ruled on. So when tenants are alleged to violate a probationary condition, the landlord is almost guaranteed an eviction. I now wanna focus on what our research shows about the mechanisms by which tenants are being evicted in the Eastern Housing Court. We define eviction in our research to mean tenants who are put under a court order that requires them to vacate their home. This could mean a court order as part of a move out agreement or an order issued by the court that allows the execution to issue. The most common way a tenant is evicted is through a move out agreement. 43% of all evictions occur through move out agreements where the tenant is ordered to leave by a specific date and if they don't do so, the landlord can get a constable to forcibly move them, forcibly remove them. The next most common way a tenant is evicted is through a default judgment. A third of all tenants who are evicted are evicted just because they don't appear in court. Next, 17% of tenants who are evicted are evicted because they violate a condition of their civil probation agreement and the landlord is then able to execute an eviction. And finally, 6% of tenants are evicted because they take their, they take their cases to trial and lose. As Councilor Weber already highlighted, this is a tiny percentage. Most tenants are being forced out, as you can see here, by way of these other three pathways, not because a judge has actually adjudicated their case. I wanna emphasize that right to counsel, along with other supports for tenants, will make a really significant difference in reducing the prevalence of all of these pathways to eviction. Many unrepresented tenants sign move out agreements because they think they have no other option, and they're quite understandably scared to take their case to trial on their own and lose. Legal representation will give tenants a stronger negotiating position, and it will allow them to actually pursue their legal defenses when they have them. Unrepresented tenants, meanwhile, often default because they, simply because they can't make it to court. They have childcare and work obligations, face transportation difficulties, and some are disabled and face additional barriers. Legal representation means that counsel can appear on their behalf, and these barriers magically fall away. There are also other reforms that can be made that will help reduce the default rate, funding organizers who can do tenant outreach and provide education and support to tenants, as well as returning first tier events to Zoom so that making it to court doesn't interfere as directly with work and childcare. Other academic research has shown that creating remote participation options for tenants significantly reduces the default rate. Council will also re reduce the number of people who are evicted because they violate a civil probation agreement. As an initial matter, tenant counsel is likely to reduce the prevalence and scope of civil probation agreements by helping tenants negotiate more favorable terms at the outset. They will be able to counsel tenants about the risks involved in signing on to these agreements, and they will be able to propose alternative resolutions that are more, more balanced and fair for tenants. As I mentioned, our data show that judges allow 96% of motions to issue execution for violation of a civil probation agreement. In most of these motions hear, motion hearings, tenants are representing themselves and are completely unaware of the defenses that might apply. Council will help tenants marshal available defenses and will give tenants a fighting chance of prevailing. 
Tenant Council will also work to connect tenants to resources and services that will resolve underlying issues and thereby allow tenants to remain in their homes. The research is clear that tenants are evicted through mechanisms that council can and will intervene in if given the opportunity. Tenant access to council and additional resources to support tenants, including tenant organizers, is an imperative if we want to enforce tenant rights, correct the imbalance of power in housing court, and reduce evictions and all the negative consequences they bring. For all these reasons, I strongly urge the council to take all necessary steps towards advancing statewide access to council. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to answering any of your questions. Thank you, Professor uh, Summers. The imbalance of power. Um, next up, um, Kadeem Norris, uh, co-managing attorney at the housing unit of or whichever order you want, folks want to go in. Oh, this is on remote as well. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. So good afternoon. My name is Kitty Morris. I'm the co-managing attorney of the housing unit at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. I want to start by congratulating the city of Boston and taking the initial steps of exploring whether or not a right to counsel program, some sort of pilot is an appropriate step for the city. I think any steps towards increasing representation in the civil litigation system is a step worth taking and a step that every Bostonian will greatly benefit from. I'm also going to incorporate by reference the comments made by Attorney Ehrlich of Greater Boston Legal Services. No one has a better firsthand understanding of what it looks like in eviction court in Boston than someone who's doing that work on a day-to-day -day basis. So I fully support the comments that he's made and the need for increased services in that space. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of time because a lot of the points that I would have liked to have made have been made by Nicole and by Boston Legal Services through their representatives. Um, so Philadelphia as a city, we first passed civil right to counsel in eviction cases in 2019. It was first funded in 2021. Since then, on average, we represent about three to 4,000 tenants in landlord tenant court on a yearly basis for eviction cases. That is compared to the nearly 14,000 cases that were filed last year in our post pandemic world. Pre-COVID, we saw about 22,000 cases filed at the height of our housing crisis. Um, I think one of the strongest things that we have been able to do is create a network of service providers who are able to show up in the right to counsel space. Similarly to Boston, the demographics of Philadelphia show that 85% of landlords showed up in court with an attorney and only 15% of tenants had access to an attorney prior to the implementation of our right to counsel program. We've been able to grow the representation rate of tenants to about 30%. But why does this matter to you and as your city? Our demographics show that the average person evicted in the city of Philadelphia is a single person of color, head of household with children. The average debt that was sought pre-COVID was roughly $2,000 to $2,500. What really feels like small amounts of money compared to larger debts and investments that need to be made but those are the faces of the people who were evicted on a consistent basis. Not only does right to counsel have a transformative impact in terms of having tenants feel like they're empowered in the judicial system, it also serves the important process of making the courts and other players realize that the person on the other side of an issue is an actual human being and not a number on a spreadsheet. Tenants often show up to court with every intention of presenting their best arguments and advocating for themselves, but their inability to use complicated legal languages or understand the proceedings and know what pieces of paper need to be filed when often makes it impossible for them to navigate complex legal systems by themselves. The, there is no justice if there's not act equal or equitable access to our legal systems. As we all discovered during the COVID-19 pandemic that 
has ravaged our country for the last three or so years. The home is an essential part of how we live. You need a house to learn, you need a house to care for your family, and for many of us, we needed a house to work in for three or four years consistently. Think about what it meant if you, your children, your partners were not able to stay at home and be safely and adequately housed during the COVID-19 crisis. For many of our clients, this is a daily reality that they are losing their homes because they are simply unable to keep up with their payments. Right to counsel by itself is not a silver bullet. It will not end the housing crisis, but it at least ensures that when someone is ne negotiating about their rights, whether it's either from a 30 day notice to quit or just be knowledgeable that you know that in Boston, only a judge can remove you from your house and how you communicate that to the other side. Having an attorney or advocate with you significantly strengthens your ability to navigate through a court system. If you take nothing else from what I say today, I would like you to take this piece away. Build a system or a pilot that works for the city of Boston. There is not a one size fits all model a right to counsel that will work for every city. Philadelphia has started with a phased in approach on a zip code by zip code implementation process, and that has been greatly successful in allowing us to learn from our own mistakes and build out outreach programs that allow us to support getting more people connected with services. But there is going to be a cost attached to whatever sort of program you create. So make sure that the most vulnerable or those who need the assistance are able to get that first. And through proof of concept, you can always expand and grow. One of the impetuses that created Right to Counsel in Philadelphia was a stout report that was convened by the Bar Association, the Philadelphia Bar Association, that showed for every dollar that was invested in eviction prevention or eviction defense services, it was a savings of $13 to the city of Philadelphia in avoided costs. That is shelter costs, that is food costs, that is relocation costs, that is costs from loss of employment, all of the associated costs with where the family needs to be taken up in a moment and moved through a system. Evictions are inherently traumatic and they destabilize families, they destabilize parents, they can impact your learning. Additionally, if you are evicted, more than likely that eviction comes with some sort of record of the eviction. And eviction records have been proven to long-term trap families in poverty and make it harder for them to find safe or affordable housing. While I've listened to some of the conversation today and there is a question of cost, there is no cost greater than the cost of not being stably housed long-term. It impacts your ability to provide for yourself, for your family and your ability for people to lift themselves up as we presume that they can do out of poverty. I would encourage all of you to think deeply about what it means to maintain and be safely housed and what the most vulnerable members of your city needs. I am happy to answer any questions about the experience that we've had in Philadelphia and lend any support or guidance along the way. I have provided the report that I referenced to Council Member Weber, who invited me to be a part of this panel, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Attorney uh, Morris. Um, next, um, Annette Duke. 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 Um, thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be before the Council, and I want to particularly thank Council Weber for raising this issue and making this part of your maiden speech. Um, on a personal note, I'd also like to thank President Luigi for bringing David Grossman into the room. He was a dear friend, a colleague, and a mentor, um, and he still con continues to inspire me, so thank you. Um, my name, again, is Annette Duke. I'm a housing attorney at the Mass Law Reform Institute. We're a statewide policy um, group. We support legal services. We work on large issues like housing and benefits, um, doing statewide policy, regulations, and the whole gamut of systemic um, issues. Obviously, access to counsel is a huge, huge issue that we've taken on. Um, you've heard housing cases are complicated, really complicated. Laws are complicated, and that's why we need representation. Um, many in Boston are doing amazing work, GBLS, 
HLAB, you'll hear from Eloise, City Life, Home Start, Volunteer Lawyers Project. You've got a great lineup, uh, Office of Housing Stability, um, to continue the conversations, to figure out how to shape whatever you're going to do. Um, and I agree with uh, my brother from uh, Philadelphia that no one size fits all, and you really need to think about how to structure something for Boston. Um, you've also heard that the disparity of representation is stark, um, and it's heading in the wrong direction. Uh, in 2021, Councilor Braden signed a resolution from this body calling for the statewide um, uh, access to council bills to be passed. Um, we're getting closer, I have to say. But in that resolution, um, it said that 85% of landlords um, had legal representation and only 8% of tenants had uh, representation, and now it's gone in the uh, wrong direction. 90% of landlords have representation, and only 3% of tenants have representation. Um, I checked the data today on the court's website. Um, and as everyone has said, tenants facing eviction are overwhelmingly people who live in poverty, women, and people of color. Um, very disturbing recent data shows that people who face eviction the most are children under five. We've got to stop that. Um, evictions, as everyone has mentioned, affects people's um, mental health, physical health, decreases school engagement, um, and lead to homelessness. Uh, recently, I don't know if you saw the Globe columnist um, Yvonne Abraham wrote after going to the Boston Housing Court and witnessing what uh, was happening there um, and seeing only a couple of tenants had lawyers and she said the rest were flying blind on one of the most consequential mornings of their life. So again, I commend you for bringing this issue before us. Um, but that's why we, along with 240 organizations, as um, Chief Dillon mentioned, including Attorney General Andrea Campbell, who also joined you in signing that resolution, um, municipal officials, faith-based organizations, tenant groups, large property owners, healthcare organizations, and many, many others are advocating for the statewide access to council bill. I feel like my role is to update you about that statewide bill and the budget and tell you a little bit about what's in that because we have thought for many years and worked on this bill um, and refined it and so it provides an important framework. You don't, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We actually need to get this wheel passed. Um, so there's two bills. There's a House bill um, which was sponsored uh, by Representative uh, Rogers and Representative Day um, which was recently, in February, reported favorably out of the Judiciary Committee. It is now in House Ways and Means. There's also a Senate bill sponsored by Senator Saldi Domenico. That bill is in the Housing Committee chaired by Senator Edwards, who also signed that 2021 resolution, and Representative Arciero. These bills, have I said, as I've said, provide a very thoughtful and deliberative framework that we have uh, worked on for years, and we keep refining it. It is now in great shape, and I want to tell you about what's in the bill. Who would be eligible for legal representation? It would be low-income tenants facing eviction and low-income owner-occupants who are actually evicting tenants. Low-income owner-occupants who live in a one- or three-family house. The, the principle is that we want to make sure that low-income people are, um, their housing is stabilized, and that applies to tenants and owner-occupants. I'm not sure if there's another bill or uh, uh, in the country that does that, but we um, felt it was very important to also protect owner-occupants. What kinds of proceedings are covered? It would be evictions, but also administrative proceedings to, for example, terminate a voucher. This came up before in terms of recertification issues. So um, this bill would provide a way to provide that kind of assistance in those cases. Who implements the program? It would be implemented by the Massachusetts Legal Assistance Corporation, um, which receives funding for legal services statewide. They would then designate nonprofits to provide full legal representation. And I want to clarify that, full legal representation. It's not limited assistance. It's not lawyer for a day. It's not lawyer for an hour. It's full legal representation. These organizations under this bill must have substantial expertise in housing law.
They have to have a demonstrated track record to, in serving the low-income community. They have to provide appropriate supervision and training. That's no small thing. Um, and they have to have a plan to reach people with limited English proficiency, which has come up as a theme here in terms of wanting to help people. Um, there also, the bill also provides that these designated organizations that are on the front lines and providing legal assistance can contract with community organizations like City Life and others to educate and inform tenants about their rights and that such information has to be in multiple languages. This is all in the bill. Um, under the bill, it, uh, there's also an advisory committee that's appointed that works with MLAC to, uh, to think about how this program is shaped. That advisory committee must have a tenant, an owner-occupant, community-based organizations, municipal officials, statewide organizations, and it must be uh, diverse across the state. Um, but the bill, one of the most important things about the bill that changed recently, um, because we've, we've learned some lessons during the um, COVID eviction, COVID, we actually started what was called the COVID Eviction Legal Help Project under Baker. Um, I was the director on the tenant side. There was also an owner-occupant side. MLAC ran the program. We hired a lot of attorneys and paralegals. Um, and what we learned was you cannot go from zero to 90 in two months. You can't go to zero to 90 in one year. So we built into the, into the bill that it needed to be phased in over five years. We know this is an urgent crisis, but we also want to build something that's sustainable and that will last. Um, and that is really critical. Um, the advisory committee works with MLAC to shape that plan. Um, there's also, so that's the bill, and the bills in House Ways and Means, um, and in the Housing Committee. There's also, um, in the governor's proposed budget, a line item for the first time ever, a dedicated line item for an access to council program in the amount of $3.5 million. That is just startup costs, and I want to be very clear about that. Um, the Boston Bar Association did a report similar to the Stout report that was referenced um, in 2020, and I'll make sure you have copies of this, that pulled together a lot of data. It took about a year to six months to pull together that re report that said it would cost about $26 million to have a statewide access to council. I did some updating um, of that recently. The cost went up to 27. There's a lot of variables um, in how that's figured. But that's an estimate, a preliminary estimate right now. Um, that 3.5 that is currently in Governor Healy's budget um, it signals that she is supporting access to council, and we were thrilled that she put it in her budget. That is also in House Ways and Means. So now we have both the bill and a line item in House Ways and Means. Next week, the Joint Committee on Ways and Means will hold its public hearing on the FY25 budget, where many will be testifying about a range of things. We will be submitting testimony supporting both the 3.5 million and passage of the full bill. We want both, are very important. Um, and 23 organizations have issued a letter to um, uh, Chair Michaelwitz supporting the statewide bill, including the Boston Housing Authority, the Office of Housing Stability, Boston Medical C Center, Boston Rape Crisis Center, Rosie's Place, um, GBLS. Boston is squarely behind trying to pass this statewide bill, and I hope that you will also put your weight into helping us do that. Um, I could go on because I've been working on this for a long time, but why don't I pause because I know that the questions will direct me in a, in a better way and pass it on to others on the panel, if that's okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I'm cognizant of the fact that uh, Professor Summers has a hard stop at five, uh, so we'll, we'll move right along. Um, Eloise uh, Lawrence, you're next. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy if, if she wants, if you want to ask questions, Professor Summers. Um, just see, um, it's 425, so we'll go ahead now and we'll go, we'll go maybe take some questions from uh, okay. um, Professor I'll, I'll, Summers before she. Um, Prof 
Professor Summers is a former colleague and friend and much smarter than I am, so I'm going to try to be as fast as possible uh, to let her uh, talk on this topic. Thank you all uh, to inviting us here. I'm here with a client and friend and City Life member, Heather Gordon, who's really actually, who's experienced what it feels like to go through uh, an eviction without counsel, um, and so I think her voice is much more valuable than mine. But very quickly, I walked over here from Housing Court where I spent the morning. I was representing tenants and I was working. Um, the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau uh, was manning the uh, attorney for the day table where we try to answer questions for all the unrepresented litigants. As many people have said today, uh, the vast majority of tenants are unrepresented and the attorney for the day only scratches the surface. Um, today was no different. Today was an average day in housing court, hundreds of cases, hundreds of tenants who are unrepresented coming up. Primarily people of color, many children in the courthouse, many children who should have been in school today or in daycare or somewhere else and not watching their parents get evicted. Uh, we're here today and those folks uh, were asking us for help and we're saying sorry no here I, ca I can tell you one thing but I can't really tell you can you go in with me no I can't go in with you because there's 12 other people here and the remarkable thing is that everybody thinks in this country I'm gonna lose my home without a lawyer I'm gonna enter a legal system I'm, I'm expected to know these rules I don't even necessarily speak English and I'm expected to somehow represent myself and often face uh, impatient judges who I recognize are overwhelmed, but are dealing all day long with unrepresented folks and don't have a lot of patience and time to explain the rules of evidence, the rules of civil procedure, what the elements of their defenses are. The, the judges don't have time, nor do they think it's their job to explain these things. And therefore, people are guessing. I spoke to a woman who had um, came to me, and she said, can you talk to me? I'm in the middle of a trial. She said, this is a, a woman of color who has a voucher, who is facing a no-fault eviction. Again, a no-fault eviction. In other words, she has done absolutely nothing wrong. She told me that she had been previously homeless for two years. She if by all appearances you would think she has the golden ticket, she has a voucher. People are dying for such a voucher. Well, the reality is she is about to be out on the street because that voucher, once she loses the eviction, which she will, I mean, she, would, she is in the middle of a, of a trial. She's trying to ask me about security deposit law, warranty of habitability, um, issues around uh, consumer protection, She's got her phone. She's saying, can I print this out? Where can I do that? None of which I can help. The judge has said, no, you must go forward today, even though she tried to tell the judge that she hadn't received discovery. She was given no time to prepare. We were not able to help her because she's in the middle of her trial. And she has a voucher, and she is going to be on. She is going to be without a home. And that should not be happening. And for a long time, when Annette came to me, Madame Duke over there, she said to me, Eloise, we have to work on access to counsel. And as a longtime lawyer, I thought, there's no way more lawyers are the answer. Never has been, never will be. But you know what? I've come around. And the reason I've come around is because we are actually more like emergency room doctors. And people are coming in on gurneys and stretchers, and they are bleeding, and they are suffering. And we cannot wait for the preventative care. The preventative care being the housing that you all are trying to build, that OHS is trying to make. There was a great question over here by the counselor. Well, don't you have a home for people to go to? Mm -hmm. No, we've torn that all down. That's public housing. We've privatized all of that. We've gotten rid of most of our affordable housing in this country. And so, in reality, no, there's nowhere to go. So, yes. I believe in emergency room doctors because we have to do something. It's a moral imperative. And I'm very, very, very pleased to see that all of you deeply understand that. You're putting the time and the energy and the resources of this august body into this really, really important issue. So thank you so much. Um, and continue anything that we can do at the Harvard Legal Aid Bureau 
um, at Harvard Law School in any way to support the efforts of the council and of the city to keep people housed and to give people a home. We're here. We're here. And I'm going to turn it over to my friend, Heather Gordon. Uh, thank you all for listening. Um, Professor Lawrence is, has not even scratched the surface of what is needed or how we need attorneys. In my situation, it's a lived experience. Regardless of how um, you go into court and you, you hear that only a judge can put you out, you're, you're still at the mercy of that judge and sometimes they're following the law to a T, but if you have an attorney next to you, like I tried to navigate that system for over a year before I was able to get attorney, professor, godsend person next to me. I was, I would be homeless within hours if she had not gone into court, stand up, said what she had to say, argue like a crazed person or argued for me as if she was arguing for her mother. I would at 73 years old right now to be homeless. I had to come up with $950 to stop the truck. Had it not been, I begged for that for a year and a half. Had it not been for her as an attorney and know to navigate the system, I would have been on the street. Eviction is violent. It breaks up the family. We have grandchildren who we are in charge of, who we, I cannot get a, a, you can't live on social security income and pay um, rent in the city of Boston. We have a right to the city. But without an attorney, it is impossible to navigate that and to say that only a judge can put you up. Because you get these notices these notice to quit, and it's done by attorney with the numbers and squiggly thing, squiggly thing next to these statements. You don't know what to do. You know, you look everywhere, and if you do not have someone like um, the attorney who spoke before, uh, what we could call him head. Um, um, and nonprofit organizations like City Life, Vida Urbana, H Lab, GBLS, we as community, the community, the people of Boston who have worked, paid our taxes, we would be all on the street corner through the wind, the rain, the sleet, the snow. We need attorneys to navigate the system. Although, as I said, it is my lived experience, this attorney has never been in my home. Don't know the circumstances of how I got here. I was a homeowner. My mortgage was sold without my knowledge or consent to people who have buku bucks. Tribeca Lending Corporation, they have a whole film festival, but they were able to buy my mortgage, more than tripled my, um, my mortgage that I was paying, and then kicked me, stole my, my, my home from me, where I raised my kids and lived in the community. I've been a volunteer for 20 years Volunteer means you work, you help without pay. And that I do with City Life Vida Urbana. We're at the courthouse prior to um, the pandemic. We would be at the courthouse in the mornings. It used to be on Thursdays that housing court at the Edward Brooks Housing Court 
all of us, we go with people as uh, in solidarity with people we don't even know, but they're in their suffering. They're about to lose their homes. They have five-year-old kids and under or over with nowhere to go. And these are the attorneys from GVLS and HLAB that keep a roof over our head. You know, we go, we go to the Office of Housing Stability, Sheila Dillon's office, they know me when I am about to come in. I don't know, they have ESP or something. <laughs> but I've been to Hawkins Street, now they're up at Center Plaza, like on a weekly basis. You know, I'm at um, City Light on Tuesdays from 6.30 to 8.30 with Professor Lawrence and um, Elridge trying to help us to um, even to write answers and discovery. You know, something that we don't know anything about. You know, that's what keeps us a roof over our head. So we need these attorneys. Please, thanks for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all right. you do. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, next, Joe Reteg. Reteg is, ma'am, Reteg is. That's what's fine. I get it right second time. It's been right. destroyed all my life, don't <laughs> worry about it. Um, I'm, I'm here representing my mother and myself um, my mother's 87 years old, and she has the beginnings of dementia. Um, she's lived at the same address for 18 years and just about 40 years in the same area. Um, I just want to say thank you to, the, to, to all the, the uh, council members also. I know Councilman Weber, and I appreciate him for, for bringing this forward because it's well overdue well overdue. This is, the, this is the first time that I'm experiencing this as far as housing court. Um, I've done law enforcement all my life. Um, as I said, I'm taking care of my mother right now because of her uh, health and her condition. Um, I've never been to housing court before, and um, I, I thought that I'd be able to maneuver it just because of my court experience, but I've never seen anything like that. I mean, first of all, due to the time that my mother was uh, given the notice to quit was because my sister was relocating up here and the uh, management company knew about it because um, it's very, very difficult for you to do something and take care of someone by yourself. So, you know, uh, my sister agreed to, uh, you know, relocate from Florida and come back up here, which, you know, my, we, we tried to get her to see if she wanted to go to Florida. She didn't want to go, my mother. Um, she wanted to stay around her doctors because um, she's been here the majority of her life. Um, so, you know, just to get back to it, 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 it just, this is what, way overdue because nobody should be subjected to that. Nobody should, be, should go to, into court, especially how, any type of court, but especially housing court, without legal representation. It's just not... It, it, it's not going to work if, if you even go in there. And it, it could be not your fault, and it still doesn't matter. Um, I was listening to uh, Councilman Santana when he brought up how many of these management companies, not only landlords, but management companies that, you know, are trying to evict, you know, that are going through eviction with people and bringing tenants into eviction and it's just not landlords, it's management companies that are doing it also. Um, and uh, they just don't have any remorse about it whatsoever when, you know, when they do it. Um, I got, I, there was retaliation with me because we formed a tenants association, mm -hmm. which they never had in the building, okay? So when we started talking to the, to the, the people that they have in the building that are, that are managers, and we started talking to their superiors, that's when everything started, you know, I mean, it was total neglect, you know, in the building. Um, and when we, when we started the Tenants Association and things started getting done, we knew that there was gonna be some sort of retaliation because there's always casualties in war. 
So we knew there was going to be retaliations, and that's exactly what happened. And uh, my mother and I were one. My sister ended up leaving after they started their, uh, their evictions, their eviction with my mother. And then when she left, I thought that maybe everything would be able to be settled in court, but it wasn't. Um, they said, no, they want to get you out now. And that was because we started the Tenants Association. And uh, that was the only reason why. Um, and like I said, um, my, mo my mother and I, we have until the end of this month. Um, when I went to, to housing court, one of the clerks told me, you're going to need a guardian. So you hear the word guardian and you figure, oh, you know, maybe she can help, you know, because she's a court, you know, she's, she's an appointed. So I put in a motion for a court guardian. That didn't help. That didn't help at all. Um, and, you know, as I said, you know, we have until the end of the month and uh, they totally disregard medical documentation, which I have a ton of right here mm -hmm. from my doctor's doc, you know, doctor. It's, it's like nothing, you know, they just don't care. And um, like I said, it's just not landlords. It's actually management companies too um, that are doing this. And I've, I've seen them just evict and, and a, a, a lot of people throughout the past year and eight months. And they were told when we were having meetings with the Tenants Association, they were actually told by um, uh, Michael Kane, which he's the, head, the uh, director of HUD for the Alliance of, of Tenants. And they were told that there was a program, um, I forget what it was, that it was, more, it, it was better off to, to go to, to not evict the person and um, because the evictions were just costing money and there were a lot of tenants that couldn't afford lawyers and they, she, they, they just kept on evicting people and that was it, that was pretty much it. You know, um, they would go through the evictions, you know, uh, getting people out of there. And like I said, this is a senior building or it was a senior building because it's not anymore because, uh, you know, they're just bringing in you know, young people, people with kids, and I, everybody in the building understands that because of the, uh, the housing situation. So, you know, nobody's really complaining about that, but it's just, you know, the way that they go about things, you know, and um, the, during the time when they first gave my mother the, because uh, she's the head of household, and I was there with her, um, I was there on as a living aid with her because I had my, she got a, a letter from the doctor stating that she needed someone with her at all at all times. Um, they revoked that on me, is what they did. They revoked the the, uh, the live and aid certification, which they say that they, they had a right to do. Um, so now you know, like I said, I'm just I'm just facing that with my mother and we're dealing with it. Um, but I just don't think it's right. Uh, she was there for 18 years. And I don't think it's right. And I've been there with her for six years, six and a half years I've been there with her, taking care of her. And I just don't think that it's, it's right. Because it's like the councilman said, said over there, it's, it's, you know, these people need to be account, you know, they need to be, be accountable for the, you know, the people that they're trying to get, you know, get out of their, you know, a place that they live or that they've lived for years. Um, the doctor says that that can affect my mother because she's been there. So even if I do get her out of there and bring her somewhere else, you know, with the dementia that could, you know, that, that, that could affect her. Um, you know, the new, the new surroundings and uh, everything else like that. So I, uh, you, you know, I'm just, I'm just doing what I have to do. Um, I have the guardian now that wants to try to put her in a nursing home. If I, if I can, I said my mother's not going into a nursing home. Yeah. She's not. Thank you, Joe. Thank you so much for your sharing your Thank story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll open up for questions uh, for, um, again, Professor Summers and um, um, Kadeem Norris are still online if, and if you wanted to have questions for those. Um, Councillor Weber? 
Yeah, okay, uh, well, and, and thank you everyone for your testimony. Uh, and thank you uh, for sharing your stories. And um, you know, if I wasn't inspired uh, to work on this before, uh, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> I am uh, doubly inspired now. Uh, because the, the, the need is incredibly great. And I guess, uh, you know, so uh, Professor Summers ha has, has to leave soon. I just have a question uh, for her in terms of what she's seen with the, uh, mediations, having studied so many here, uh, what we could do to make that process uh, fair, if she has any um, recommendations. Sure, and I, I'm sure that um, Professor Lawrence can speak to this as well, and, and others too. Um, so I, I wish I were more hopeful about mediation. Um, the reality is that a lot of the cases that I was reviewing were cases that went to mediation, and um, I, I showed you what the outcomes are, and they're really not great for tenants without counsel. So I wish that um, this was a situation where we could say, oh, bring in more mediators, that will solve the problem um, short of counsel. But I think realistically, my experience practicing in housing court and what I'm seeing from those, um, from the review of all these case files and the analysis is that um, mediation on its own without the tenant having counsel um, is not producing um, very good outcomes from the perspective of tenants. Um, and so I, I really haven't seen anything that to me really suggests that like, oh, we need to train mediators better, have more mediators, um, or require that the, par the parties go to mediation, that's gonna make it better. Because um, really what we're seeing is that without counsel, um, tenants really just aren't getting very good results. I mean, I, I didn't look at, um, you know, specifically mediation versus cases negotiated, um, just, you know, outside of mediation. But uh, the results overall across the board um, just are not very good for tenants um, in all of these settlements. Um, so I really think that the focus should be more on counsel and other supports. Okay, I just, I, I, I'm sorry to hijack this chair, but because Professor Summers has to leave, I, I, I just want to hear if anyone else has any questions. Uh, yes, did, any, did you have questions for Professor Summers? Um, no, I mean, I guess Professor Summers, um, if there's, a, you know, thank you for presenting your research, I think, um, really thinking about this in terms of civil probation and just like the astronomical numbers behind that which ones, you know, agreement for judgments end up actually leading to eviction. If there's a, an area of your research that you think like would help us that you still haven't explored, is there an area of a research that you're looking at now with respect to either agreements for judgment or the most, most vulnerable populations that you think would be helpful to us? And then a second question is, I've been thinking like, even if we don't have a full blown out pilot and I think I've, I've asked um, Eloise this question as well. Is there like a target population, if we were to start small, is there like a target population that you think would be best when you're looking at those agreements for judgment? Is, um, is it is it women of, you know, women of, uh, families with children, women of color with children, if we were to start in a particular like high crisis group, what would, what would your recommendation be based on what you've seen? Sure, yeah, um, both really good questions. So in terms of um, what I'm working on now, um, as I take your question, just sort of like current reasons that could be helpful. So I'm, I'm actually doing another project still involving Boston where I'm looking specifically at the process by which these um, settlement agreements are being signed um, and doing another full review of um, a different set of case files, more recent case files. Um, and what I'm finding in that review is that, as someone earlier mentioned, um, basically all of these settlements are form agreements. Um, that wasn't specifically what I was looking at before, but what I'm looking at now is the fact that um, if you look at agreements by a landlord attorney firm, um, you see that every landlord attorney firm basically has a standard form settlement agreement, mm -hmm. and that's almost never deviated from, mm -hmm. um, which suggests that um, in the case of un uh, tenants who don't have access mm -hmm. to counsel. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what I'm finding is is that um, this really gets to the sort of negotiation piece um, and that tenants are really not able to negotiate any change in terms um, without counsel um, at all because they all look exactly the same regardless of um, the background characteristics of the case, the tenancy, et cetera, things that you would expect to make a difference in terms of settlement outcomes. I, every What tenants are signing is just what the firm has already drafted um, prior to coming to court. Those are type of agreements. Um, 
so hopefully I will have um, within the next six months or so um, something else to show you all there. Um, in terms of targeting, um, what I'm finding actually is that um, what my research with um, Justin Steele has shown is that if, if um, the goal, we haven't looked um, specifically at demographics within cases, um, just because it's really hard to get that data. The, the court records don't show demographic characteristics of um, the tenants involved. Um, so we've we've looked at neighborhood characteristics, but um, not much beyond that. But what, what we're finding is that the tenants who are most at risk of eviction are tenants who are facing no fault eviction and fault eviction. Um, that they are evicted, forced out of their homes at much higher rates as compared to tenants who are facing eviction for non-payment of rent. Of course, tenants facing non-payment of rent evictions are also forced out at relatively high rates, um, but tenants facing no fault and fault evictions are at particularly high risk. Um, so I think there, you know, there are lots of factors that might go into targeting um, an early stage pilot and, and who you want to prioritize. I know other um, jurisdictions have done it by zip code and things like that, but I can tell you from the data that um, tenants with those types of cases are, are especially at risk of displacement. Thank you, Professor Summers. And I just want to just, just want to underline one point that I think is incredibly important, the difference between a lawyer and a non-lawyer. You have a client who, uh, a tenant who under duress may sign an agreement for judgment because they don't know any better, they just want to get out of court, like it's stressful, it's traumatic, they sign an agreement for judgment. And it says agreement for judgment, and it has the wording in there, you insert uh, an attorney into the situation, and these are the things that we would do on Thursday at housing court. You cross out the for judgment, you cross out other things in the letter, to, in, the, in, the, in the agreement, so that it's more favorable to the tenant, and just by doing that, you're able to, inserting an attorney or inserting someone for limited representation, you're able to do a better job of preventing displacement. So we're really talking about mediating, even if it's in a limited representation sense, a, a way of preserving someone's tenancy or preventing displacement just by inserting an, a lawyer at that stage where it's a hallway negotiation and you're striking out words that would be damning for the tenant. So thank you for uplifting that, Professor Summers, and thank you for being here with us. Professor Santana, did you have any questions for uh, Professor Summers? <coughs> okay. Thank you, Professor Summers. I appreciate your being here this afternoon, and thank you for your testimony. Okay. Um, uh, questions for anyone else in the panel? Uh, just, uh, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I guess, uh, 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 Attorney Duke, uh, if you could just to explain, you know, uh, why we pursued a right to counsel program, you know, uh, statewide, uh, you know, during COVID and, and, you know, your role in that, you know, uh, why that program instead of s some other other ideas, um, and what what you what we what data we got out. Good questions. Um, so at that point in time, in 2020. We had already started the um, Access to Counsel campaign statewide. Um, and we were making um, headway. This was during the Baker administration. We were making headway, and then COVID hit. And we pivoted the coalition um, because our lead sponsor urged us to do more of a COVID pilot. That then turned into, because federal dollars came into Governor Baker, um, to going directly to Governor Baker, not the legislature. Um, and saying we could do um, a pilot program uh, for just for COVID um, and try and scale something up quickly. So it didn't go through the legislature. It was different. It went right to the governor because a lot of money was coming in from the federal government at that point. Um, it was $18 million that um, Baker gave this program. It was for both owner occupants and tenants statewide. Um, it went through MLAC, like the bill. So we used some of what we had uh, constructed in the framework of the bill. Um, and then uh, when that program was stopped, um, we then got back into fighting for the bill um, for the long term. So that's a little bit of history about that program. In terms of the data that came out of that, um, there were about 5,000 cases that were handled during that time period. Um, and in, um, I knew you were going to ask this, so I got my notes here. Um, it's 4,698 evictions that were handled over a 14-month period. 
Um, and positive outcomes were obtained in 87% of the cases receiving extended service. And what positive meant was 61% of the cases, the tenancy was preserved. Um, and in the remaining 26 ten percent, tenants got more time, which can be very important. Mm -hmm. So those were the positive outcomes um, that came out of that project. It was a project um, statewide. Uh, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. So it really was felt like a, a proof of concept, like you had an, it was like its own pilot, that, that money that you got was, you were able to really get some really good data to. We got some really good data. I think we learned a lot of good lessons too. Um, things not to, things that didn't work so well and things that worked well. Right, and what we learned was you can't do it in three months. You can't hire 134 paralegals and lawyers and expect to have uh, supervisors and the whole system set up. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why we changed the bill so we could phase it in smartly. Mm -hmm. That was one of the lessons learned. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mr. Webb. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't know if we have lost Attorney Morris. Uh, sorry to I can come back. Are you okay. Still there? Sorry, I'm still here. You're there. Okay. Uh, thank you for for sticking around. Um, uh, you know, I guess uh, so. Um, you know, Philadelphia started this program. Said you. Tw I was in started in 2019, uh, at least, you know, you're given the authority, right? Um, That's correct. And, it and, was, uh, go ahead. No, no, you, you can, uh, yeah, okay, I'll just go ahead. Uh, uh, and so, you know, I guess uh, you're, you're part of a movement now, you know, there's 17 municipalities across the country that are doing this. Uh, there's, I think, two states, uh, correct, uh, Four states. Four states and one county. States. Okay, and one county. Um, and, you know, uh, for, um, I, I, I guess, you know, wh what have you seen uh, that, you know, that you haven't, I guess, mentioned already, but like, wh why should other, other places have this kind of program uh, or a right to counsel as opposed to other kinds of uh, services like what right to counsel especially does that accomplish that some other things uh, don't so I think the professionals that were just in the room from Boston and most importantly the two individuals or tenants or homeowner, homeowners who went through this process said it best even when you I know the initial at some point there was a question about what if you just tell people online that only a judge can throw you out but it's a much different system or much different process when you show up in court and you have an advocate by your side we think about the cost of what it means to invest in right to counsel and as someone said earlier we've torn down most of the public housing across the united states so there is the need for people to be housed there's a need for people to be stably housed and quite often the most affordable housing that you will ever find is the home that you are in already because if you don't have to relocate in an instant, you eliminate all of the costs that come with that. At some point, even as judicious as we might want to be, whenever you move, it costs the money above what you anticipate to move. And I think keeping people safely housed allows them to engage in the workforce more meaningfully. It allows children to go to school. It prevents emotional harm. It allows you to kind of, even when you have medical needs, it allows you to stay in an environment with which you are most comfortable. There is absolutely no substitute, and I like what the attorney said earlier, for the emergency medicine type of practice that has become representation of people in landlord-tenant court, because there is way more volume than there is the ability to serve people, and also the process is not designed or by design the process accounts for being able to push people out really quickly there's not a meaningful you're coming to court your landlord is asking for you to move from the property there's not a meaningful automatic pause that says what resources can we get for you to navigate the process. I think about Philadelphia where there's a 10 year waiting period to get on a subsidized housing list if you need to get a subsidized voucher. So if you are in a unit and you are getting evicted, there's no instant place for you to go. Our shelter system has been overloaded, will continue to be overloaded. There was some mention of the 
immigration crisis that is complicating this whole system. So I think there are lots of reasons why we could say there needs to be representation for people in municipal court in eviction cases. I'm sorry, municipal court is the Philadelphia court where that happens. But I think if for no other reason, it is almost the last line of defense that people have where they feel supported in the court system and where someone can explain to them what their rights and processes are and where regardless of what the opinion of the judges or the opposing side is, they have an advocate with them. A lot of people show up to court and they meet with an attorney who's usually a landlord's attorney, and they don't actually understand or realize that that attorney is not their attorney or not their advocate. They assume that they're required to tell them the truth and that they're required to negotiate in good faith. But they have no idea what that actually means and whether or not the information that is being conveyed to them by the other side is correct. So when you think about the imbalance in power and knowledge of how to navigate a system and what it means when our most vulnerable citizens are just being pushed through a system with no support, it's going to turn around and be the, the burden of the city of Boston to otherwise support those individuals throughout. So if you can keep them stably housed through right to counsel, it avoids that additional cost and all of the associated disruptive displacements that come with it. Yeah, I, Sorry, I know that was a bit much of an answer for your question. No, no it, it, I, I'd much rather hear you speak than, than me speak. Uh, um, can, can you just explain to us, so how, how, how is it, fun, how is the program funded? You know, um, do you have to, ask for money every year or, you know, and what are the sources? So it's a mixture of funding in the city of Philadelphia. I think Philadelphia is a city of first class in Pennsylvania. So the authorization to be able to create the program is a little different, but we are funded through a combination of general fund dollars and other specific housing dedicated funding that is created by the city through an investment. There is a annual contractual process where the city puts out a bid to do this work. In Philadelphia, the work is primarily done by legal aid agencies that, as I believe it was spoken to earlier, which is something that's required by the proposed statewide bill, is that there's a history and a knowledge of the process. So it's not just we're paying people to do this work and anyone can jump in and do the work. It's like long-term partners who've already been in this space are doing this work. And it's funded directly by the city. As of yet, there is no statewide funding for right to counsel. But the, similar to your our governor, our governor also just proposed an additional $5 million on statewide funding for right to counsel and eviction-related prevention services in Pennsylvania. So this is definitely a nationwide recognition that this is a problem that needs to be addressed because we unfortunately have very limited resources to build housing and avoid that issue proactively. Thank you. I, Chair, I just have one last question. Um, sorry for Professor Lawrence. Uh, just, um, I've, I've, I've been hearing about a proposed revision to Supreme Judicial Court Rule 3.03, uh, which governs law students' ability to practice in court. Can you just explain what is, What's happening? Who's uh, pushing this and, and what the impact of the proposed amendments would be? Sure. Thank you for that question. Um, so SJC Rule 303, as, as you know, um, allows law students who do not, have not yet passed the bar um, serve as counsel under the supervision of a barred attorney. Um, they are there specifically to serve indigent clients. So the purpose is both um, as an educational purpose for the law students, but really is an access to justice issue because it is intended for those who would not otherwise be able to afford an attorney. The changes that, there are a multitude of changes, um, and I'm happy, I would love to talk more to the council about this, um, but specifically some of the changes that we're most concerned about are just additional onerous um, hurdles that both the, both the attorney, supervising attorney, and the student would need to go through, which would really cut down on the number of students that could participate and make it more onerous in practice to actually represent people. One of the most in, um, concerning aspects of the, new, of the proposal by the Supreme Judicial Court, uh, which is now open for comment, um, is the issue that a judge on the his or her own uh, 
judgment can decide with their own discretion whether or not basically a student can appear before them. So the problem with that is you say, well, that, that makes kind of some sense as a judge can run their own courtroom. But imagine now a judge says, I don't like how you were uh, overly zealous the last time you were before me. Or you were really rigorous and you, you went to all the way to a jury trial and that really slowed things down in my courtroom. Which these things have been said to me uh, multiple times um, about my students, about us insisting on the full rights of our clients. Um, I, can, I can be sure that there are many judges given the discretion to choose whether I can appear before them, which is very nice to not have me appear before them. So um, I think that that's very pernicious, and it has especially, I think, given what they have shown, uh, what we have seen uh, in many studies, uh, but especially of late, of how biased racially our courts are, um, this really could hurt um, both our clients of color, but attorneys of color and students, attorneys of color as well. Could I, could I add just one thing to that? Yes, go ahead. Um, I think in terms of access to counsel, this rule is really important because this is the pipeline. Th these are the people who are going to practice and do access to counsel work. And if we're st stopping that pipeline from happening right off the bat, that's not going to provide the infrastructure that we really need to think about long term. So mm -hmm. I hope you can put your weight into that one too. Thank you. Uh, th thank you. Back to you, Chair. Do you have questions? I, yeah. uh, Councilor Lujan. Thank you. Um, and we will absolutely be putting our weight into making sure that 303 stays as it is. That's how I learned how to become an attorney, and that's how I was able to help my neighbors in Mattapan, High Park, all around the city uh, prevent eviction and foreclosure. So I wanted to just start by thanking you, Joe and Heather, for coming here and sharing your trauma with us, sharing your experiences of eviction. Joe, I hope that you're able to preserve your mom's home. Um, Thank you. Because even it's, it, right, eviction is a form of trauma and it is so disruptive. And so, um, and, and Heather, you describing um, Eloise's uh, zealous representation is exactly how I know her. Um, and I can imagine you, I, I, you mentioned, or someone mentioned tenant organizing, I think it was you, Joe, how you use that trauma by showing up for people in court every Thursday or whenever you can, or city life meetings on Tuesday evenings. Um, and the way that we, especially people of color, especially people who have had their backs against the wall, find a way to turn their pain into purpose. And I just want to thank you for showing up for others. You're doing that by being here with us here today. Um, and I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, Attorney Morris, Attorney uh, Summers, Eloise, um, and, and, and Annette for, for being here. I you know that this council previously passed a resolution um, and uh, have that have, have the bill numbers changed they have okay from when they were first introduced yes. just thinking about what we'll do because obviously I believe we pass resolutions when we believe in something we believe in this and that's something that I defer to the lead sponsor that's something that we can do as we continue to fight for mo more money in the budget to make m more heads possible heads as in you back there from Greater Boston Legal Services and the incredible work that you are doing and that our legal services community does on shoestring budgets right we, our budget is a reflection of what we value if we value our people if we value stable neighborhoods if we value fighting strongly against uh, displacement uh, against the corporate greed and the way that we put profit over everyday people, then I think that we need to make sure that our budget reflects the need for a council. Um, and so that's something that I, I'll be pushing for as we fight alongside statewide efforts for, for council for everyone. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm also realized that we have some folks waiting on Zoom to make um, public testimony. And then we also have some folks in the room who want to testify as well. Uh, so while we get our um, folks on Zoom uh, lined up, um, Kabira Myers and Andrew Ashbrook and Tree Tran, um, we will maybe take someone in the room. Uh, have we David? La David, I'm sorry, I, I'm having. No problem. Yes, you, if you'd like to step up to the, uh, yes, introduce yourself, and uh, we'll. Oh, beg your pardon. Sorry, can the panel? Yes. Uh, 
You had one more question for the panel. Yes, yes, please. Sorry, sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists for being here, and I know I know we're definitely over time. Um, I asked this previous question in, in the last panel, and they deferred me to come to this panel, so I'm just going to re-ask it. Um, you know, I want to reiterate that the studies show us um, what it will actually it will actually be cheaper for us to invest in preventing evictions than it is for us to keep um, paying to deal with all the uh, repercussions created because we haven't um, taken uh, the simple step of making sure that um, tenants have access to a lawyer. Um, as I mentioned before, the Boston Bar, Bar Association found that full representation in eviction cases would save the state over $63 million. Um, as I mentioned, I asked this earlier, um, and the, the, the first panel su suggested that I ask this panel. So I'd like to ask you all if you can share any insight you have into what services the city of Boston spends money on for people who have been evicted and what of those costs we could offset by investing in the right to counsel pilot program. Um, I can tell you what the Boston Bar Association um, study, which um, I can make sure you all have, um, uh, says in terms of the savings. I can't tell you exactly the savings for Boston. Okay. Um, Thank you. But it's, it's, as you said, it's, it's huge, $63 million. Um, $41 million would come from the cost from reduced emergency shelter assistance. $17 million would cost from reduced health care. Four million would come from reduced foster care. Those were the top three. But there were other costs too that, and this was a conservative, a conservative estimate, the 63. But there were other costs in terms of, and you've mentioned it, education, um, behavioral supports for, for children experiencing homelessness, um, school transportation costs for children experiencing homelessness, uh, correctional system costs associated with homelessness. The use of court staff time um, and the cost that it it costs landlords to evict tenants, the cost, the executions, the um, moving out costs, substantial costs for landlords that would be saved if we could prevent evictions. It would be a win-win for everyone, um, and there there were other costs too. Um, I think the the largest cost is the human cost is the trauma. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do have other questions, but I definitely want to make sure that the public testimony um, is being prioritized. And I just want to thank all the panelists, but um, also want to especially thank um, Joe and Heather. Uh, I, I, I echo um, Councilor President uh, remarks, and, and you know, thank you for sharing your stories and, and your traumas here with us today. Thank you, thank you. So thank you, panelists, and thank you all for being here. We will continue to work. We're, we're in the process. We're not done with this. Thank you very <laughs> Lots much. Lots more work to do. Thank you. David, would you like to step up and introduce yourself and make your testimony? Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, could you limit your comments to two minutes? Where we have a sure, lot I'll of make people. it short and brief. Very good. Thank you. Uh, my name is Shah, uh, David Lahijaniha. Uh, I used to be an East Boston resident for 50 years. Uh, and then I got evicted without probable cause. I moved to Rivia, and I'm a member of City Life over 13 years. I'm a volunteer, and when I am laid off, I'm in a courthouse Monday through Friday from opening to closing. When people go through eviction, it's like having a heart attack, a stroke, a nervous breakdown all at the same time. Especially when you cannot take your kid to school, you have to ask boss to get day off. They won't pay you, they know you, they want to, you know, they want to do anything to stress you out. I went through it even though I have the experience. And I went through a very, very rough time. Thank to Professor Lawrence that stood by me and let me go through this process and I'm here to say, if the city council or any member can have one day on Sundays listen to the people who are getting evicted, they can understand why this bill is so important to be going through as soon as possible. You have people are getting divorced over eviction and have nothing to do with it. You have mother hitting the kids. You have people come to church to get uh, food, because not they don't have the money, just so nervous they don't know what to do. I live in Riviera. On Fridays, 
and back of a Revere Church, we give out food. In East Boston, Orient Heights, they give food to the people. If you go there one day, you will see how many people are desperate for this uh, bill to go through so you can have, look up and say, yes, I save a family. Yeah. That's all, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, thank you, David. Um, next, Ed Pazan. Would you like to come down? Yes. And then online, uh, who have we got? We got those lined up. Okay. These folks here. Thank you, Ed. Can um, you hear me? Thank you, Ed. You've got two minutes. Oh, I wrote a very short piece. Thank you very much. Okay. My name is Ed Pesnice, and um, I've lived in Boston since 1975. Um, and I, I live in Jamaica Plain in the Forbes building since uh, 2007. Um, and um, I'm living with two chronic illnesses. And um, the Forbes building originally was created to be for um, elders, 62 or over, or <clears throat> a person with a disability or chronic illness. But now, if anyone moves, it's automatically market rate, which is legal, because it's a private develop, privately owned development. Um, I'm almost done. So <clears throat> if I didn't move, I'm sorry, if I didn't live in the fourth building, I would be displaced immediately, because I'd have nowhere to go. Um, my family doesn't live here, they live in Tennessee. <clears throat> um, and the final thing I want to say is, um, briefly, uh, I've worked for 45 years. I'm sort of in semi-retirement because you can't live on Social Security. Um, and I have taught advocate for families with disabled children in this city. <coughs> and um, the last thing, in 2007, where many people, including myself, we started Family Screen together, um, which basically is a um, multi-generational, multilingual program at 35% of the children have some kind of disability or illness, it's free. Um, but nothing got started alone. There were a lot of people that helped. Um, so I, my final thought <clears throat> is that I feel this bill would enable and empower individuals, low income or struggling people, a lawyer if eviction, um, and um, a support of fair hearing is long overdue. I've never been evicted. But I understand if someone is, it's not fair. So I think we have to have all the voices heard in the bill passed. Thank you. So we're just going to take some uh, of the folks waiting to testify via Zoom. Um, Kabira Myers. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for this opportunity. I will try to speak quickly. I hope that I don't speak too quickly um, because I want to ensure that, um, that I cover everything within the, uh, the time allotted to me. Uh, so first off, my name is Kabira Myers. I am a New Jersey attorney of 19 years and I'm the coordinator of the state of New Jersey's first government run right to counsel office the City of Newark's Office of Tenant Legal Services. I was asked to appear today by Councilman Weber's office. Newark, New Jersey is a city where more than 75% of its residents are renters, the majority of whom spend at least 35% of their monthly household income on rent. Uh, in December 2018, Newark's Mayor Raz Baraka initiated a blueprint, one strategy of which was the creation and eventual passage of a right to counsel, of a right to counsel law, uh, similar to Boston's docket number 0265, whose purpose is to reduce unwarranted evictions in the city of Newark and reduce homelessness by providing free legal services to Newark tenants of low income who are facing the threat of eviction. Since the passage of this le legislation in Newark, the state of New Jersey has been developing similar initiatives statewide. Before this office officially opened, many North tenants were unaware of their rights and while having no other place to live, often permanently vacated their homes out of fear when faced with the threat of eviction, even when it was unwarranted. 
Nearly five years after my office officially opened its doors, we have provided literally thousands of renter households with direct legal assistance and potentially thousands more through town halls and other community outreach endeavors. When my, um, when my office handles an eviction case, my right to counsel office, our attorneys almost always find at least one legal defense that is viable enough to either get the case dismissed, which means the tenant gets to stay in her housing, or protract the case long enough for the tenant to find alternative housing. Hence, our office and others like it are a lifeline for tenants who cannot afford a lawyer when facing the threat of eviction. New Jersey is one of the most ethnically diverse states in the country, yet in my near two decades of practicing law, I have continually observed that the overwhelming majority of tenants facing eviction are black and brown people of low income, some of whom need interpreters, have disabilities, and do not use the internet. Hence, to be effective, a right to counsel office must be aware of the local evictions landscape and be, and be accessible to all. Finally, reducing income inequality and increasing affordable housing are no small undertakings, but the legal advocacy that comes from a right to counsel office helps ensure that all people regardless of disability, familial status, or immigration status, have access to justice and affordable, decent housing, which my office believes is a human right. The Office of Tenant Legal Services and the City of Newark therefore wholeheartedly support docket number 0265, and we ask the City of Boston to immediately pass this important, life-changing legislation. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm open to any questions uh, that anyone may have. Thank you so much, and thank you for bearing with us uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Did, that, did you have any questions for Attorney? Okay, we're good. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next up, we'll take uh, Andrew Ashbrook, NCCRC Eviction Implementation Specialist. Uh, RTC sure. Implementation Specialist. Good afternoon, sure. Andrew. Thank you for bearing Thank with us. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, my name is Andrew Ashbrook. I'm the Eviction um, Right to Counsel Implementation Specialist at the National Coalition for a Civil Right to Counsel, the NCCRC. Um, for those that don't know, the NCCRC is a nonprofit organization that's dedicated to ensuring access to justice by advocating for right to counsel programs across the country. Um, and by helping communities enact and implement ordinances um, that are appropriate for them. Um, I'm really excited to be speaking in favor of this um, proposed Right to Counsel pilot program in Boston. Um, and I want to thank everybody today that's already spoken um, and really highlighted the importance um, and really the trauma that comes with evictions and how difficult um, and violent it can be for communities. Um, what I really see my role as today is to provide um, some more nationwide perspective. Um, this has already been said a couple times, but there's currently 22 jurisdictions nationwide that have right to counsel programs. I've met 17 cities, four states, and one county. Um, and as these programs have been enacted, um, one of the things that I really want to highlight is that they're working um, and that we see that these programs are um, doing well to address inherent inequalities in eviction court. Um, they're shown to reduce displacement within communities, uh, and they also save jurisdictions money when they are enacted. Um, so we already heard um, some today about um, studies in Boston um, showing less than 10% of tenants um, are represented compared to um, over 90% of landlords um, are represented. That's very typical nationwide for jurisdictions that don't have right to counsel programs. Um, and it disproportionately affects communities of color and um, minority communities. Um, in Baltimore, for example, 
um, there were 80% of tenants um, had a potential defense to evictions, um, but only 8% of those tenants were able to successfully raise those defenses um, without uh, representation. Uh, in New York City, um, which was the first city that passed right to council um, back in 2017, um, housing court judges have testified that the right to council has improved the process and made it more efficient and just. Um, these programs also reduce displacement within communities. Um, Stout, which is an independent financial analysis company, um, has consistently found that the right to counsel leads to more than 90% of tenants avoiding disruptive displacement. Um, in New York City, um, after right to counsel was passed, um, um, they've seen 84% of tenants remaining in their homes, um, and the eviction filing rate dropped um, by 30% from 2014 to 2019. San Francisco saw a 10% filing rate drop in just one year after right to counsel was passed, um, and 59% of all tenants were, um, are staying housed. Um, and in Cleveland, 93% of tenants um, represented by counsel are avoiding eviction or an involuntary move. Um, and lastly, I just want to say that, you know, the, um, you know, the programs, um, right to counsel programs do save um, money, though they're an investment up front um, at the end of the day between um, shelters, emergency, emergency health care and other uh, negative effects, um, they save money. In Philadelphia, they found that $3.5 million in investment in right to counsel would yield over $45 million in savings. Um, and I understand that in 2020, the Boston Bar Association um, found that uh, the, in the Commonwealth, 26.29 million um, investment would save the state um, over $63 million. Um, so, um, you know, I just want to support everything that has been said already today um, and highlight the importance of this, not only from um, court fairness, but also from um, a human element. Um, the NCCRC is really supportive of this, and we are happy to help however needed. Um, we've helped craft um, lots of these um, ordinances and helped um, plan for their implementation across the country, and we would be happy to help our, however possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. Next, we will have Tree Tran. Who's going to come in on Zoom? Drew, um, could you unmute yourself and introduce yourself? You've got the mic. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Shree Tran. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Rosie's Place here in the city. Uh, I just want to quickly offer our unequivocal support of our right to counsel um, pilot program here. Um, we've been a long time supporters and members of the statewide coalition led by the amazing work of Annette Duke. Um, we will be submitting more detailed written testimony to the committee, um, but I just wanted to communicate how, um, how important we think this is, and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we have two more folks going to testify online, but we'll take some folks from who are here in the in the in the chamber. Uh, Samuel Pierce and Rita Lara. We'll take Samuel first, and then Rita, and then we'll we'll take someone. Uh, we have some folks online still. Thank you, hi Sam. Thank you. Hi, how Go are you? Mind. Thank you very much, um, Councillor. Lucien, Braden, and uh, Weber for having this very important meeting, and thank you, Councillor Santana, for sticking around. Um, I think the most important thing that I heard, at least from some of the panel testimony, was that 50% of the court order settlement, or basically 50% of the cases that, that are heard end in a court order settlement, um, which basically, I think, sets up the point of why they need to have a right to counsel in the first place because they might be signing something that they don't know that they're signing. Um, 
it's, it sounds like the other significant number was that 85% of the cases end in no-fault evictions. So that's where the language access, I think, would be important because people might not be showing up because they just didn't even understand that they should be there. Um, I think that as we start to look at the funding for it, um, I think that that's where the financial people can think about the numbers, but I do think that the, the, the biggest problem is the difference between a tenant at will and someone who has an annual lease. Because I think that if you have a lease, then at least you have a signed agreement. Whereas if you're a tenant at will, there's very little that the court can do, at least at this point, to keep the uh, landlord from kicking you out of, of their house, right? And I think that um, it also talks about the fact that we really give more weight to the homeowner and the property owner than the tenant. And, you know, thinking about the fact that there are tenants who are, um, are voters as well as property owners who are voters, and also looking at the Federal Reserve rate where they were saying that the, um, the net worth for a pr families of color was $8 compared to 250000 I think that part of the other point is really looking at rent-to-own housing as another option um, to evictions because the city of Boston has its own housing stock, obviously, with the BHA. So thank you very much uh, for allowing me to testify and have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Sam. Um, Rita Lara, you're next. You have the floor. Two thank minutes. You. Thank you, um, Madam Chair Lujan and um, Councillors Breeden, Weber, Santana. Um, my name is Rita Lara, and I'm with um, Maverick Land and Community Services. I'm the executive director. We're a nonprofit in East Boston. Um, and, you know, I agree with all of what's been said around the devastating effects of an eviction record, barriers for tenants continuing to look for housing. Um, uh, you know, it's a serious health equity issue. So I'm not going to sort of duplicate all that's been said, but primarily I, I want to share you know, our own experience. We have a housing support lab that's been supported through uh, uh, a, a 9C earmark at the state, and that's, that's been uh, available for the last two years in East Boston. And you know what, what that lab does is it, it takes advantage of cross-sectoral partnerships. So we have a partnership with New Law Lab, which is a legal design entity, and a law school. And we have a team of law school students who represent people who are referred through the lab. We have a case manager who works really closely with the advisor and the team of law school students. And you know, w w from our perspective, um, you know, as a mid-sized community-based organization, being able to access those kind of partnerships is a real game changer. So there are ways to do this that are affordable. It's about really working outside our systemic silos. The city of Boston is resource rich. You know, it, it, our models like this scalable. Um, and I just want to share um, a couple of things. It, you know, nine, you know, this thought has already been shared, but nine out of, out of 10 tenants are underrepresented, you know, have zero represented representation in eviction court. Um, so in East Boston, you know, we, you know, we are the, the, the one or the two that do have, you know, representation if they come through uh, the Maverick Land and Community Services and Northeastern Law School New Law Lab, um, um, you know, referral process. And, and, I, and I, the last thing I want to share, because I don't have a lot of time, is that it's an absolute game changer, absolute game changer when someone goes from being absolutely desperate, having no representation, suddenly they go into court with six or eight law students. That is a game changer. It's a game changer for morale. It's a game changer for representation. Uh, and and you know, I, I'm pretty sure there's not a lot of that going on. So can we create scalability in this resource-rich city where there are tons of law schools? And, and I, I would, you know, I think it's also important to note that we worked really closely in the design post-pandemic with, with, with City Life with Urbana, so they were involved in, in supporting the design of the lab, 
And it, it's also very important to have, with New Law Lab, what we have is a legal design partner. So we have an innovator who can really sort of be a bridge between the law school and the community-based organization. So we're working across three systems. Um, so I would seek resources that are already here and seek scalability if you can, as opposed to uh, spending a lot of money rebuilding infrastructure that you may not need. Thank so. you, Rita. Thank you for all your work. Um, Mary um, Canducci, would you like to take um, the floor? You've got some comments? Yeah, over here, thank you. Is this on? on your, you'll have the floor. Just speak, it's just step up oh, to just the mic. Yeah, okay, yes. thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, City Councilor Ben Weber for asking me to come here. Um, everything that everybody has said is 100% true. I don't think I could add anything new except it is very traumatic to get a notice of eviction. I've lived in my apartment for eight years. I've lived in West Roxbury for 45 years. Um, with the, the process, I have no idea what's going on. I was just referred to the uh, Greater Boston Legal Services. I really haven't talked to anybody yet except the intake person. And it's very scary. I don't ever feel good. I'm nervous. I'm a wreck. I have chest pains, stomach aches. I don't sleep. I don't eat. It's horrible. Uh, it's more traumatic than you can ever imagine. I'm 69 years old, and I'm actually facing homelessness, which, how did I get here? It is freaking me out. And I just keep waiting every day for the official summons. You know, I, I go to the mail, it, it, it's horrible. It's not a way to live. I don't like leaving my house because I'm afraid someone's gonna come in and take everything. It's, it's, it's unbearable. I have nothing else to say. It's, it's traumatic beyond. You know, I'm a college educated person. I have a lot of uh, health issues, which prevents me from working full time. Uh, Social Security doesn't cut the mustard. <laughs> and uh, it's bad. I just don't know what else to say. Thank you, Mary. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you. Um, Councillor Weber, would you like to say something? Yeah, uh, th uh, thank you, Mary. And in my maiden speech, I, I discussed how I became interested in this issue. And it was Miss um, uh, Canducci called me while I was uh, campaigning and reached out. And so I just want to thank Miss Canducci for for reaching out and and for coming here today. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Uh, next, we've got two more vir virtual um, folks to testify virtually. Uh, Lashina and Eduardo. Uh, he's, he's, he's gone. Okay, okay, so we'll, we'll do Lashina and then Eduardo. So, Lashina, can you hear us? You have the floor. Okay, let me unmute it. All right, let me start my video. I didn't know I had to do all that. Hello. So I do, I want to thank everybody because listening to what I'm listening to today is something I've been fighting for. And I want to thank y'all for finally stepping up to the plate to have this conversation. But I do have some concerns because it's kind of like my conversation. So I was hoping the law be Lashina's law, first of all, because um, People was afraid to speak up about what was going on with anything in society because of racism and the way that, you know, Papa got to the
But yeah, these are my experiences, so they're not lies, and it's really happening. And so I went to Tanya Anderson, Counselor Tanya Anderson, just last week and had to hang up on them, very frustrated with them because they kept trying to give me resources that was failing me, like Greater Boston Legal Services, to fix a problem that Boston Housing did. Boston Housing evicted me wrongfully, and they don't want to right that wrong and give me back my Section 8. And I worked hard to get that Section 8, and I had it for 13 years before I was retaliated against by housing. Housing retaliated against me, abused the authorities to come and take my Section 8. First, they came, and it was in 2008. They came and said, oh, I owed my landlord rent. I went to court. Court said, I don't owe the landlord rent. I bought it back to housing. Housing said, oh, well, you're still pending the termination for something in 2006. Here it is, 2008. I went before two recertifications. And they're going to say it was a serious offense of a drug raid. It was a third-party drug raid. It was 0.00 value. I was never arrested. My doors wasn't kicked down or nothing. And then I had a neighbor who had the same raid who is still in her apartment still with her Section 8 from Boston Housing because she had a drug problem, and I did. And I only had a problem with standing up for myself, so therefore Sheena. I was content. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I need to finish because this is the whole purpose. This is my whole story. You know, y'all are being a face of the work that I've called your offices and asked y'all for help with. So if anybody know what's going on with, with housing and, and this whole meeting, it's me. So how come nobody reached out to me? All right, so that's another thing. Then Franklin Highland Apartments and Maloney Properties is the one that beat me in court. So after they beat me in court, they really got a house upgrade. You go over there now and they got ACs for all their tenants. They got a whole new building after they evicted me. It was like they was rewarded through the courts yeah. because everybody wanted to condemn me. Lashina, so, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I have to ask you to wrap it up. You've, you've gone over your t two minutes. Okay, Thank so you. I'm going to wrap it up. All right, and housing stability is a disappointment because they're traumatizing. And I'm thinking, like, if you're going to put money into this, the courts already have a system where they court appoint attorneys to defendants. So whatever system they have, I think it should be the same system for housing. And the budget is already prepared yeah. and projected. Thank so you. I think you should at least use them as a demo. Thank you for taking since the time to comment. Off, I'm going to write the rest of it and send it in the comments since y'all are in a rush. All right? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time to testify. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Okay. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, everyone who has come in in person to testify and listen to our conversation this afternoon. Thank you to all our panelists. The, the folks are still here. And, um, and my colleagues and all the folks who testified online and participated. Um, as the Chair of Housing, this uh, is going to be an ongoing conversation. Uh, which this is not the end of the story by any means. Uh, we, have, as we have more work to do. Uh, there's some uh, legislation at the State House that we need to weigh in and support and get it across the line. And uh, we look forward to continuing this process going forward. So thank you all. Uh, this uh, meeting is adjourned.